Hey, yo, what's good, what's good, what's good? Welcome to Reflections of a DJ, the role podcast presented by DJ City and Beat Source. I'm one of your hosts, DJ Crooked. We got Jamie the Great here. Yeah. DJ Neva is under the weather, and he couldn't join us here in L.A. We have uh, we have invaded the Beat Source offices here in L.A., mm-hmm. and we're setting up shop, and uh, I'm really happy to announce that we have a guest here that I've been working on. I've been wanting this guest here for four years. Yep. Maybe more. Since maybe the longer. beginning of this podcast, we wanted yeah, yeah. him on. Since the beginning of this podcast, I've known this DJ, this individual for a long time. And he's a part of a lot of great things in DJ history in the past 20 years or more. He's one of the founding fathers to me of like mashups and like distribution and and everything from vinyl to edits to MP3s. Like you name it. This guy's had his hands on a lot of shit behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And he's a great DJ. Mm -hmm. And he's been a part of uh, a lot of great things like Dexstar for one. Yep. And uh, he's a part of the DJ uh, AM documentary. Yep. And um, I'm really happy to have him here. We have Orange County's finest, <laughs> DJ Kevin Scott. What's good, man? Uh, thank you, man. Yeah, Appreciate what's good? That. Finally, four years, bro. I know. We put it off as long as we could, but here yeah. we are. I, you know, I, I don't remember how we first met. I think we met in Vegas, right? Maybe, possibly? I believe that we met in San Diego. San Diego. Ooh. Really? Yeah, I was doing Stingery. Mm, maybe. Okay, yeah, yeah, that, sounds about, uh, that sounds about right. You were like a regular there. You were like the guy. I was there every month. Yeah. yeah. Stingery was a huge club. It's now Nova. Yeah. Oh, is mm-hmm. that what it is? It's Nova. Yeah. It used to be Omnia, and then and now it's Nova. Yeah, yeah. 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 and uh, I don't remember exactly what, but somehow we were we met like in a hotel either before or after mm-hmm. the gig or whatever. And, sounds shady. And Yeah, yeah. it does. <laughs> that's, that's it like sounds a like a drug shade. dealer or something, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> no, we met, we met that night, and then... Um, you were in Vegas at that time, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think from there we started connecting whenever I'd come out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, like, the the first time I heard of your name was from your, like, annual pool parties or <laughs> barbecues. Do you remember this? Of course. Uh, oh, I remember the pool party. So, like, he, <laughs> he used to have this pool party every year. Mm-hmm. That's right. And it was, like, star-studded. <laughs> and star-studded? And, you know, the thing is, like, not a lot of DJs, I mean, like... He had this party that, like... This is probably the MySpace era, right? It was, yeah. So, like... I don't know how we saw the pictures, probably on MySpace. Yeah. So there had to been one year where you posted like a bunch of pictures from this pool party he had Mm -hmm. at his house in Orange County, right? Yeah. That's right. Beautiful house, right? (laughs) Right. And then, but (laughs) then, I mean, it had a pool. (laughs) And then, so we'd see these pictures on MySpace, Mm -hmm. and like AM would be there. And there would be homicide. He would, yeah. homicide would pull up in one of his Lamborghinis or something. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so you know, I'm moving to Vegas, and every and I see all these DJs. Like every fucking dope DJ in the world went to this pool party. Yeah. Okay. And it was like every DJ saw this on MySpace, and they're like, "I need to go to this shit. Like, Ooh. I have to go to this pool party." <laughs> and I remember being like, "Who the fuck is this Kevin Scott dude? <laughs> why the fuck is everyone at his house? How does he know AM?" Why is like why are all these DJs come in and, and it'd be like these videos of just like DJs scratching yeah. and just fucking around on these <laughs> decks in a pool. Like I don't even think there were women there. There was maybe no, some. There was. There was. <laughs> <laughs> there was. There was pictures yeah, of that too. There was some girls there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was but DJ but it was it just looked like every DJ and I mean it, it, the community wasn't as big as it is now. Right. It was a little smaller. That's right. But it was like every DJ was like, "Yo, I got to get into there." Yeah. yeah, people would yeah. fly in for it. Yeah, yeah. I heard one person flew in and they rented a limo and they showed up in a limo, right? They did. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> I'm not gonna say. I, I kinda, ironically, though, yeah. nobody ever saw that because everybody's in the backyard. Everyone's in the backyard. Nobody yeah, I was gonna say unless everyone's in the front, no one's gonna see him pull yeah, up nobody, on the limo. We just heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> So, what <laughs> he walked in did you guys see him pull up in the limo but that's how that's how big this shit was it, it got big yeah. yeah i mean the first year you know it was just like everybody that i knew in the la area yeah right so it was like you know Graham funky five i've been f- friends with five right. for a long time am came travis barker showed up right with am um Damn melody who i've been friends with forever mm-hmm. uh you know, so it was like a lot of friends, and then everybody just kind of took turns DJing. But, and I, yeah. I took the, I took the bartenders from the place that I worked in Orange County, and mm-hmm. had them come and actually, because we have a, a little outdoor bar there yeah. by the pool, and I had them bartend, and we played music. And I don't really have any neighbors because it's in a cul-de-sac, so we Ooh. could, we could just go. Yeah, yeah. So we would go, and it would get wilder and wilder. We had a poker table set up in the garage, mm. and we would just, you know, go off, and it was so much fun the first year that we're like, well, let's just keep doing it, right. 
So we kept doing it, and then every year it grew bigger and bigger, and people would fly from, I mean, we had people flying from, in from like Pittsburgh, Chicago, mm-hmm. like all over. And I would just put the invite out, and they're like, yo, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come. Where, where's some hotels around? Yeah, <laughs> like, right. It's like Diddy's parties. <laughs> you know, like the and, one. But it was just something, you know, we did just to try to bring the community together, mm-hmm. you know, uh, just to get DJs together, and people could meet and hang out. It was a very informal right. environment. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was fun. I I don't think I ever went because oh, the, because the New York in me is like uh, <laughs> oh, shit. no no this is the thing and it's a problem right and <laughs> yes. with some New Yorkers is <laughs> we've, that we've, 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 when when something becomes so big that it, it it seems like people are going there for the wrong reasons mm. like I can I recoil yeah, yeah. yeah. and I'm kind of like I don't want to be seen as one of those people coming mm. in for the wrong reasons. Does that make sense? It does make sense. But like, I'd rather go to a, a three-person dinner than like a twenty-person DJ dinner. Well, that, all, like, you know what I mean. That's one hundred percent the level I'm on right now. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm, oh. I'm just like smaller. <laughs> but better. see, I've been on that. You know, yeah, like yeah. I don't want to remember they used to have these DJ dinners because right. we'd all be working in Vegas, right? And there'd be like these these twenty DJs at a dinner. Yeah. And it was like, oh, it just got bigger, and then there were all these like weird people there, and we were like, yo, what is this? Like now yeah, we're. Yeah. Now we're just talking to a bunch of weirdos and <laughs> well, it, who are you? So it went each year, and then in 2009, you know, it started to get a little bit like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, people would say, "Hey, I want to invite my homies a DJ or whatever," and I'd be mm-hmm. like, "You know, okay." But you know, it's only so big. Like the the backyard isn't that big. It maybe hold like a hundred people. Right. You know, so it's like I didn't want this huge thing that was like too big to manage. But I do remember a funny story. Like in 2009, E Rock was coming. Mm. Uh, from San Francisco, yeah, yeah, right. And he's like, "Yeah, I want to bring a young DJ with me, and uh, you know, he's going to come out with me." And it was Jay Espinoza, mm. and I didn't know him yeah. at the time; like, I hadn't met him yet. And he was young, you know, right. kid or whatever. And he was like the first person to show up to the house. So, like my, early, early, yeah, like early. And so my <laughs> like my, ten, my wife, like ten o'clock, yeah, like 10 the o'clock. door, like doors open at ten o'clock. Yeah. He's there, <laughs> yeah, and he's he's hanging out, right? And uh, he's helping set up. <laughs> yeah, he's like yeah, Kevin's, like yo, clean the pool a little bit. Well, I didn't get to that yet. My wife yeah. put him to work. Yeah. So, <laughs> So listen to this. So my friend Albie, he used to work at LRG and he sent, he, you know, he, he, they were like help sponsor the event. They would right. like give stuff, you know, big clothing company back in the day. Right. So he sent like all of these, they were like green blow up pool balloons, basically, mm-hmm. you know, like the, you know, the like, beach ball, like a beach ball, yeah. but, but it was green. It said LRG on the side of it. And there, we had like 50 of them and they weren't blown up yet. So my wife's like to Jay, like, you should you need to blow all these up. So this yeah. poor kid is sitting yeah. over there. Jay Espinosa is just sitting over there yeah. and he's blowing up balloons. Like he's like out of breath. Like I thought that was pretty funny because that's hilarious. Because now I mean, look at Jay now. Like, I mean, you know, yeah, super the man. Insane, yeah, man. he's the man. Fucking three style champion. champion. That's right. Right. World the champion. champion. But before, you know? before all that, he was blowing the balloons like out of my pool party. Yeah, that's right. That's right. My wife put him to work. You look able, like you need to blow up all these balloons. <laughs> Well, that's what he did Start and he did a great job he was good at that too your wife's so cool to have all of these fucking DJs <laughs> and these misfits at your fucking house just hanging yeah. out she's always been cool since day one she has yeah, yeah. so I, yeah I met my wife in 1992 Oof. Oof. we were kids yeah you know I, uh, she had just finished high school um, and uh, you know we met at a club actually yeah and um, we've been together ever since 31 years 31 25 years 25 years married Wow. Um, Congrats, and bro. Thank you, man. And, uh, you know, the first few years I started actually travel DJing. She was like my road manager. She'd come with me, mm. make sure I got paid or we got paid. Yeah. And make sure everything was like the way it was supposed to be. And uh, she earned the nickname from AM, uh, Joy the G. Joy the she's, G. She's a G. She man. is a G. She, she is, yeah. She's a ride or die. She is. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's dope because every time I would see you in Vegas, you know, I, I know I'd see two things. I'd see a new pair of kicks. <laughs> Bro, I see, I see like a he's pair not of wearing kicks. just any pair of kicks today. Yeah. He's wearing no, a Supreme no. Dunks. Uh, yeah, this this dude Bring like got a little something special. For you. you know, <laughs> he, he would always have some type of like you know two thousand two thousand dollar you know five oh, thousand. Yeah, on. you used to have some expensive ass shit. He probably got from and Rico you're the too. one of the few that would wear that. You would wear the shit. You'd be like, oh, I, I'm I'm not the guy that leaves it in the closet. Yeah, like if I have it, I'm gonna wear it. Yeah, yeah and then I would up. always and I would always see your wife and she'd be there like hanging out, yeah, being a G man. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, she's like the ultimate right hand man, partner in crime. Yeah, yeah. She's you know she's always there, you know, like, and she was really supportive of everything that I was trying to do. Um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't a success out the gate. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It took a long time to build into something sustainable. And um, at the beginning, she's the one that had the good job. She's the one that had the health benefits. She's the one that's like, do your thing. Yeah, I'll hold it down. 
you know, and she did. Um, That's so she crazy. held it down for us and, until I figured it out. And right. it took a while, you know, because when I was started DJing, there wasn't a clear path. You know what I mean? Like there's no internet. There's no, there's no clear path. It wasn't a formula for anybody. Mm -hmm. It was honestly like the, the most that any of us wanted from, you know, our generation was to make a living. If right. we could make a living, right. you know, from DJing, that was like a win. That was like, holy shit. Absolutely. If I'm making almost the same amount of money as I would working for a company. Right. And then as you start getting bigger, you're like, holy shit, I'm making more money and then more money. And then, and then, uh, right. and then you're like, wow, this is, this is actually like a career. This is like crazy. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. To the I, shock of us all, right? Yeah. I feel like that's not enough for the DJs nowadays, but that was uh, enough for us. It was. <laughs> that was, was enough for us at that's the time. Right. It's still enough for me. Too, yeah, so I, that's the way I see it. I'm like, if I make 50000 minimum a year, I think I'll be okay. Like, I mean, yeah. All right. it, it, you can do more than that. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> yeah. Be, I'm being modest. I'm being honest. Right. Keep it low, you know? Because that, my thing was like, if I can make as much as a cop does a year, I'll be okay. Mm. So I was just like, that's the... Was that where you were going to be? Yeah. <laughs> oh. I had a criminal justice degree and stuff like that. But I was like, if I can make as much as I was going to make in this field, yeah. I think I can make it happen. So... Yeah. Yeah, be modest. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I, w I want to actually talk about because it's funny. Like, when you came to the offices, you know, you saw Phenom, you saw Quickie. There's so yeah. much history with, mm -hmm. with DJ City, with you, yeah. with music, and, you know. And we were talking about all this, all these mashups that... We're on vinyl, yeah. the distribution. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to go back a little bit, and I want to okay. talk about how you kind of get started, and how you, you know, how you met War and Peace too. Mm -hmm. You guys linked up, yep. And I know you guys pressed up a lot of. I mean, you guys probably pressed up one of the first, one of the first like mashups on vinyl, right? I, don't, I think there was some stuff before that. But no, but it was like one of the first with a, like there was yeah, there wasn't we many early. out. There wasn't many out. No, there wasn't a lot yeah. to to choose from for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a there's a lot to cover there. So let's uh, yeah, yeah, go let's ahead. just rewind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh I guess we'll just start at the beginning for me, like my my musical journey and how we kind of got into that. So yeah, yeah. growing up, I was really I was I was into music. I had a, like a dual deck cassette player mm -hmm. and I used to make pause tapes. Right. Love and that. um and then I had a brother who was 10 years older than me. So when I was 14, he got married. And it was the first time I ever saw a DJ like mix two records together. Oh. So this would have been like 86, 87. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked at my dad and I'm like, that's what I want to do. Like, that's what this pause tape shit should be. It should be like mixing records. Right. And I really wanted to do that. And um, so around that time, um, you know, my dad was a banker. That's what my dad did. He was a banker and a lawyer, right? And he's like, I'll, I'll buy you the equipment. Okay. I was like, but every gig you do, you have to pay me a portion of it and I'll match it. Right. He was trying to teach me about like getting a loan and paying it back. And right, all this right, stuff, right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got the equipment, started getting some records and, um, you know, just didn't know what I was doing at first, you know, trying to figure <laughs> it out. I mean, there wasn't no, there's no manuals in, there's no YouTube, there's no, there's nothing. nothing. Right. There's nothing, you know? And it's like, it's just all foreign. Like, okay, this, I guess this slider speeds it up and slows it down and this, you know, and mm -hmm. trying to like figure all this shit out. And um, I just stuck with it. And then there was a few musical styles that really kind of made things take off for me. Hip house, early acid house, rave music. I was really into dance music. I was really into early hip hop, mm -hmm. early 80s hip hop. Um, and so I would buy those records and I would just sit and practice with them and try to get better. Mm -hmm. And through the 90s, you know, I started seeing like people were making records, like they were producing stuff. And I was like, I want to do that. Right. But there was no computer-based program. So, you know, I bought like a keyboard and a sampler and I was trying to figure it out. And this shit was just beyond me. I like, could not make anything cool with this. I'm like, this is too hard. Like you need an engineering degree to figure out how this stuff works. And then around uh, 1999, I think it was, uh, Sonic, a company called Sonic Foundry released Acid 1.0, which was a loop-based, computer-based program mm -hmm. where you could take loops and you could, you know, you could arrange it. It was very visual. And that was like, oh, this is it. I, I could do this. Like, can't do that other shit, but I could do this. Mm -hmm. And so I just started experimenting, and I just started by making like some, you know, intro edits, some blends. I tried, right. I tried to do like some party break stuff, like sample stuff, you know, and make things. And and I picked up on it kind of quick, and I was like, oh, you know, I like this. So I should just put out a record. That's not knowing how to do any of that. Mm -hmm. And so in, I think it was early two thousand. I had enough tracks together to make a vinyl compilation. And <laughs> my wife was like, okay, you know, you can do this. So I took like almost all the money we had. 
Wow. And pressed up these records. How much it, was it? Do you remember? It was like three grand. It was three not grand. a lot. We didn't yeah, have yeah. much money. We, we were like just married, you know, like didn't have a lot of money. And press up all these records and they're all sitting in boxes in the, in the front. It's like, great. Now I got this record, like go sell it. So I had to figure out how to distribute it, how to sell it. So how many it like, did you have? How many did you make? 1,500, I think, was the first it's a one. Lot. Damn. It was, let me tell you. Was that the minimum? I think like a, I think a thousand was the minimum, but there was a there was like a price break. If you right, 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 of so course. Like, let, me, right, right. let me do the fifteen hundred. <laughs> I can sell these. You know? and, uh, and then all those fifteen hundred uh, records arrived. You're like, holy shit, this is a lot, right? Dude, it arrived on a pallet, <laughs> and it was all like yeah. taped up. And I'm like, how do I even get this home? Right, you know. And then <laughs> I was like, got it home, and I'm sitting there staring at all the boxes, and I'm like, now I got to go like be a door to door salesman. Or, yeah, like, yeah. Well, back then, like fax people the you know the track listing. You want to buy this record? And they're like, what was the track listing? Bro, I don't remember. You don't remember? I mean, that was a long time ago. But was it hip hop mostly? It was. It was like blends. There was like a couple blends on there. There was like a party break, like a like a primitive party break, mm -hmm. and there was like a couple intro edits for records that were like hard to mix. I remember one of them was um, Miss Fat Booty. I think it was. Oh, okay. most deaf. Most deaf. Yeah, it didn't have like an intro at all. So I put like an intro on it and put that yeah. on there. I don't remember all all the stuff that was on there, but so I went around to record stores and tried to sell it. And then, you know, we started to gain some momentum. And then after that, um, as it was starting to grow a little bit, I met Quickie, who, you know, owns DJ City. Yeah. And uh, he was distributing records out of an apartment in, at UCLA, near UCLA. And I met him, and it was like him and Hoppa and another Brian. And um, I was like, you guys want to help distribute these? And he's like, yeah. So that started our relationship. Um, and DJ City was like one of our biggest distributors for for years, yeah. Pretty much all the way to the end of the of the vinyl days, and then uh, around around that same time, I met Warren. He wouldn't originally take my phone calls when he was at Hip Hop Site. <laughs> I couldn't get him to take my phone calls. I knew, see, I had so somebody. you knew of Hip Hop Site in Las Vegas. Well, right? I was in a record pool here in Southern California with DJ Five. Okay, mm. and Five was working at Hip Hop Site, right? And he's like, I introduced you to Warren. Mm. I'm, I'm gonna get him on the phone for you, but he couldn't. Like Warren wouldn't take my call. I didn't have anything Warren wanted. You know? mm. And then uh, he didn't was, want that extended intro yeah, he, he to this fat he booty. He, he, didn't, didn't, want want no. he didn't want no, that. No, that wasn't in. You know. Now, were want. you selling the records to the to like DJ City or, and to you were trying to sell it to hip hop side or was it consignment? like wholesale? Wholesale. Oh, it was wholesale because they would do they would do retail, right? They, they, That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So oh, it's okay. basically distribution. Okay. And they probably have like they probably have a whole listing of all these record stores across the country, right? Well, Maybe. that was hard to get, but yeah, yeah. We, we did eventually yeah. kind of just cold call people, you know, right. oh, shit. and try to create relationships. I and mean, it was a lot of work, actually. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how I did that. I mean, yeah, I that, sounds, that sounds really difficult. Well, I remember like being in New York in the early 2000s and yeah. like actually going on djcity.com mm -hmm. and buying all like the, the fat wax, all right. of like the f fill in the gaps. Yeah, yeah. Right? Reruns. All Lethal them. Weapons. Yeah. So that was straight yeah. hits. That was yeah. a company in the Bay Area that did Lethal Weapons. Lethal Weapons. Mix, yeah. Mixed Factors. That was, that was them so too. So it was only on the West Coast that had extended intros and they, they, they would have these hype intros. Mm -hmm. And whenever I think of a hype intro, I think of you. Uh. <laughs> because you are the master of hype intros. I, I feel like that is not... <laughs> you know? No, no, no. <laughs> he would have like, you know, he would have a Bob Sinclair, you know. Yeah. World. Uh, world hold on hold. with like a come on come on let's do it let's do it come on, come on let's do it do it and i'd be like yeah that's some that's kevin scott because he has uh, <laughs> that's the exclusive kevin scott with the intro the but hype it, edit yeah because it was so important though like it kind of like at the time it would set djs apart from everybody else because they wouldn't have anything you know that's right you know yeah. what i'm saying so but that, we're talking about like pre serato oh yeah when motherfuckers could make any intro they wanted they were playing these and right. when I when I had these in New York, people would come up like, "Yo, where'd you get that?" Right. And I'd be like, "Uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to tell them about DJ City. You know, right. I was just like, oh, yeah, I just got. You know, I Can went out of you. town and I found this shit. You yeah, know, yeah. And then all keep that. it a secret. Yeah, yeah. Keep yeah, it a yeah. secret. That's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I actually really got interested in, in the idea of that um, in the '80s. Actually, there was a remix service called Mix It Records. I don't know if you remember this. Cameron Paul was the guy who made those. He was mm -hmm. like a, should look that up. It's kind of interesting history. He was one of the first dudes that was making remix services. And he did a remix of Bust a Move by Young MC, like when it came out. Mm. And he added a bunch of elements to it. He added a new drum track to it. He added samples from uh, Michael Zager band, Let's All Chant. And it had original keyboards in it. And I went to like an 18 and over club and I heard somebody play that. I'm like, what the, f 
what is this? What version is this? And I saw like the pink, you know, record sleeve. They, they all had a pink record sleeve with like a, a tone arm on it. And it said, mix it. And I was like, what is this? You know? And I come to find out it was like a DJ only, you know, mail service where he, he'd make the vinyl. And that was kind of my first introduction to this idea that mm. there could be versions that weren't available to the public that added a lot to the club. And that, that really interested me. Like, I was like, what is that? That, that seems really cool that you could play something mm -hmm. that people don't have access to. And when they show up there, it, you know, it sort of, it gives you an identity that's different than just playing a regular record. And I think I carried that all the way through to like, when I was doing stuff, like let's make versions that aren't regularly available. Let's right. try to add something to this, to the programming and to the night. And that was kind of my mindset, you know, from early on. In, in the late 80s and one Christmas I remember like it was like 89 or something I just started DJing and I told my mom like what do you want for Christmas I'm like, I want a subscription to this mix it mm. you know I want to start getting these records and she got it for me so every month I would get one of those records delivered in the mail and it was like this dude you know making these original different remixes of whatever was hot at the time everything from like Bell Biv DeVoe to Salt and Pepper Push right. It. He had his own versions that he was making, and you could only get that through like signing a application and all this That's stuff. That's the crazy shit. Yeah. And there was a few services like that. Wicked Mix was like that. Wicked Mix, uh, yep. yeah. But Mix It was kind of the first one that I knew about. And wow. that was, I think that kind of set my brain in motion to this idea of like, I would have never thought that it would like start in the 80s somewhere. Like, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, there was a few back then, you know, uh, Hot you, Tracks. Hot Tracks. Where, where were they based, the Mix It things? That was Bay Area. Bay Area. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, like all these A bar <laughs> yeah. and the intros, like the hype shit, that all came from the West Coast, right? Kind of? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Because, you know, the East Coast kind of had a whole different sort of style and take on it. And right. the West Coast was more about, you know, clean mixing and then trying to add different elements to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's what I was more familiar with and what I was hearing when I went out, like to 18 Over Clubs. That's what I was hearing. So right. that had the biggest influence. There wasn't a lot of ways to listen to somebody from the East Coast back then. As a West Coast guy, I was like, I didn't know what you guys were doing. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we were dropping we for were one. Dropping on the one. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, right. Originals and all that. Yeah, yeah. But it, we were the same way too. Like on the radio, it was completely different where you would play the instrumental. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you would mix it in and then you would play, you know, you, you bring it back to the one. On, on the that was big out here on power, like in the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. All the DJs were doing that. Yeah, yeah. I remember hearing that thinking like, you can't do that in a club. Like, But yeah, I, I felt like, yeah, a lot of like the LA radio DJs set the tone for how DJs. I would agree with that. But but it was it was good. It was really good because it, it created a very high standard of technical ability. Oh, right. yeah. Everyone wanted to be extremely technically mm -hmm. uh, as amazing as all the DJs on the radio. That was the YouTube back then, right? Right. It's like you listen to the radio because yeah. you didn't have a YouTube to go to. So it's like, how are they doing it? And it was like, you know, Mr. Chalk, like one of the cleanest mixers yep. ever, mm -hmm. right? You listen to him, it's like, damn, I got to really tighten up like my mixes. Because right. mm -hmm. yeah. that dude doesn't ever make a mistake, you know? Or mm -hmm. like Mellow, listen to Mellow. Like the first time I ever heard Mellow D play, this is before I knew him. He was doing a mix. It was like bounce rock skate with um, good times. What, I'm trying to think Maybe. what it was. It was like it was one of his right. classic <laughs> mixes, you know. And I like pulled over the cars. I was like, "Holy shit! Who is this dude? Like, this is crazy!" Just how talented he was, and how clean it was, and how perfect it was. Mm -hmm. Come to find out, that's just mellow. Like, yeah. always that good. You know what I mean? Perfectionist. But, but yeah, that you're right. The radio was kind of like our. That's how we figured out what to do and how to do it right. Mm -hmm. And so it did set a good example for clean mixing and stuff like that back then. And and then. It uh, to me, it makes sense with the extended intros because you guys were always so technically great, and yeah. then you guys were so clean that you these intros really just kind of like, it, you know, it, it kind of followed the uh, the standard from the radio. Well, to, there's like the DJs. I think especially now you kind of need a blend of both uh, styles if you really want to be yeah, effective, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you get the oh shit moments when you just drop a record mm -hmm. for sure. But there's also a, a value in kind of musical clean mixing in a way that you're taking people kind of on a journey, which is probably really hard now. now mm -hmm. but back when I was doing it, you weren't fighting against a cell phone. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it was a little bit easier to kind of take people on a journey because they were more focused on what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of always my thing was like, okay, I want to put these records together in a very musical way where they're, you know, they're in key and they sound good together. Mm -hmm. And people are, are taking more notice of like, the, the musicality of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, he's actually doing something back there. These songs sound like they're meant to be together. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was I was very much into that style of DJing. That was always kind of my thing. Yeah. 
So then you reached out to War and Peace in Vegas. He yeah. wasn't he wasn't taking your calls. Right. And then uh, through a mutual friend, I got my hands on the J-Lo and Ja Rule record, Ain't It Funny. Uh-huh. And there was no promo for that. It was like impossible to find. And I pressed it up with an intro mm. for you. And uh, I called Warren and Warren wanted that one. <laughs> And he answered, and he, he answered, he answered that call. He answered that call, and he uh, he ordered a ton of them. Wow! And they like sold out like first weekend, you know. So he called me back, and then he invited me out to Vegas. Like, come hang out. I'm doing raw at the Luxor, mm. and I went and saw Mr. Bob for the first right. time. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Bob at, at Raw, and it was like a life changing experience because those dudes. That was one of the illest, hypest nights I've ever seen in my life, and I've yeah. seen a lot of pretty crazy stuff but yeah, that yeah. was that was a party man mm-hmm. and uh, those guys were running las vegas completely running it yeah and mr bob was the best hype man i've ever seen he he was just always came in at the perfect spot you know uh warren gave him a, a mixer so he cut out the music yeah, yeah, yeah. He, was and he would mixer. talk just at the perfect time <laughs> he would say all the funny he, like he was a comedian slash hype man mm-hmm. and he was like he'd make you laugh he'd make you throw your hands up you know like he was just so good and warren was so good at program and putting the music together yeah, yeah. sort of take you on a journey like they would you know they would do all these different sets within the night and it never felt stale or old or boring and um so then i was like wow this guy's like the man you know yeah, yeah. and i was looking for like a somebody to partner up with and so warren and i partnered up i think it was like 2004 which was also the same year i met am dj am so uh, that was a big year a lot of stuff happened but warren and i have been you know um together since man that's yeah. my guy i love him yeah, for, I mean, so like at this time, you're DJing right, yeah. in the clubs, yeah. but you're doing like a lot of these edits and you're making a lot right. of side money like doing for distribution a little bit. Like That's right. So yeah. I'm, ma- I'm making edits and making records. Yeah. And I was DJing. I had a, a residency at a spot. It was a college bar and it was right by Cal State Fullerton. Okay. It was called Off Campus Pub. And it, it, like, it was just like a little bar. It, actually, the funny thing about that place is Lame name, but it got voted like one of the top 50 college bars by like Playboy It's a horrible magazine. name. It's a, it's a terrible name. name. Yeah, I agree with <laughs> you. Campus. It's terrible. But everybody Dude. called it OCP, Off Campus Pub, right? OCP. That sounds this better. The, that sounds better. It does sound Pretty better. Down <laughs> That's why they called it that. But that was the OCP. spot. And I played there um, from like 96 to 2007. Wow. I played there 11 years every Thursday. Holy that shit. That was the night. I had a line out the door. I mean, a lot of, you know, like well-known people would come in there. Warren G would come in there and like, you know, different people, like just random people. And um, I mean, that was kind of like my first real residency, long-term residency right, that, yeah. you know. So I was making the records and I was doing that and I had met Warren. And um, I was also sending the records out to all the radio DJs. So I knew Vice, and obviously through Five, and I knew, you know, Five and a lot of those guys. Mm-hmm. And I was sending records out and, Vice called and he's like, hey, there's this DJ in LA. He wants to get some of your records and you should hook him up. He's he's big deal up here. Yeah. And I go, okay, who's that? And he's like, DJ AM. Mm. Never heard of him. You never heard of him? <laughs> no. No internet, no nothing. This is know. big AM too, right? No, he. I think he was losing the weight. He was losing the weight. This is like 04. So okay. he's like losing the weight. Okay. He's already with Nicole Richie. He's losing the okay, weight. Okay, like post-operation. Yeah. Yes. Right, yeah. yeah. So, but he hasn't, he's not in his skinniest form yet, yeah, yeah. but he's losing the weight. He's Got pretty it. skinny, yeah. right? <laughs> And I was like, okay, you know, I, I didn't know who he was. I didn't, I, was, I didn't really think that much of it, to be honest, at the time. Mm-hmm. So I sent my partner at the time to go drop off the records. I was like, yeah, can you go drop off the records? This dude in LA, his name's AM, you know, blah, blah, blah. So he goes and he drops them off and, uh, and he comes back and he's like, dude, this guy is like, the, he's the real deal. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, dude, he gave me two tickets to a Jay-Z after party. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, he's DJing a Jay Z after party. Like, he told me to go. Like, he gave me two tickets to this, and like, he he's like, you know, he's like, it's a big deal. Oh, and he gave me this uh, card, and on the back of it, he wrote, you know, his uh, AIM AOL Instant Messenger. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. AIM. Yeah. So he wrote his AIM on the back of it. And he that said was a he, big deal. Yeah, yeah that's a big, a big deal. deal. AIM was a shit. Uh, yeah, C C X T D J A M A O L dot com. Right? Still remember that? Crazy Town. That's what it was. Crazy Town. DJ Crazy AIM. Town. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, he wants you to hit him up. And I was like, okay. So I hit him up that night. Hey, man, how you like the records or whatever? And um, it just was like instant friendship. Yeah. We had a lot of stuff in common and we liked a lot of the same music. And we were roughly the same age. It was just a lot of mutual interest. Damn, man. And we would talk all night on AIM, play <laughs> poker. 
<laughs> until like six in the morning. My wife would be getting ready for work. And she'd be like, you're still awake? Yeah. So what are you doing? I'm, like, I'm talking to AM. And she's like, who's AM? It's like, yo, you know? it's, it's, it's crazy when you get that first taste of a bromance. Yeah, no. Yeah. no it's, it's, it's <laughs> like the, I was like the first bromance I ever had. And yeah. I was like, damn, this dude's really interesting you're guy. Like, wow, I'm, I'm really connecting with this Yeah. Guy. <laughs> Yeah, and and it's, the funny part is to take it a step further. So like the first time he invited me to the house, it, like I get I get to the house. You're like, honey, what do I wear? I don't know what to wear. <laughs> no, no. Kevin is blushing right now too. A little, a little bit. Because you're funny. Because you know you're onto something. No, yeah. you're funny. Uh, so I I get there and Nicole Richie's there because yeah. they're dating at the time, mm -hmm. and she's like, oh, so you're the guy that's like. A am spending all his time with and she's like <laughs> grilling me right and she's like come on we're gonna go to lunch am doesn't like sushi so you're gonna go with me and i was like what is what's happening right now so am stayed at the crib and nicole richie takes me to a sushi place <laughs> right which i mean i'm like this is a terrible idea right you know i'm married she's famous like right. gonna somebody's gonna take a picture or did something she, did she have the show already or not yet oh yeah she had simple life and all that she was oh she was, she was, she was, was the top of the yeah yeah so we go, we go to lunch together and it's like, it wasn't awkward though. It was fine, you know, but she was just asking me questions. Oh, so you're married or whatever. And I think she was kind of like, this guy's okay. I don't mind if AM hangs out with this guy because mm. he's married, not one of his single friends. You right, know what right, I mean? right, 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 yeah. right. So, so I kind of, you know, I got to know her. And, you got the and, approval uh, stamp. Exactly. And uh, so, you know, we just, you know, we hung out a lot at that time and, and the friendship happened quickly. Wow. And um, yeah, so that, that's how I met him. Were you always a sneakerhead, or did did AM kind of? Rub he brought off on that you? out of me in a big he way. Did, I right? was like kicks, but not on. Dude, that guy was on a whole different level. You weren't part of the Air Max crew, right? That no, was, no, that no. was Ben, him, and Homicide, and yeah, that yeah. was well before me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 No, nah, but you were not five thousand dollars on the foot just uh, casually <laughs> just now. I won these. Uh, do you remember Poker Stars? Poker? Yeah, 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 yeah. So AM and I used to play a lot of online poker, and we used to enter tournaments and stuff. And one time I entered like a twenty five dollar buy in tournament. And there was like 1,800 people in this tournament. I heard about this. And I won it. Yeah. And it was like $6,700. I remember that. It was like crazy. I Quickie, Quickie knows the story. I remember uh, hanging out with you after Body English one night at Hard Rock. Yeah. What was that horrible after hours diner we would go to? Ruby's? Uh, or? Lucky's 24-7, that one? <laughs> it was the worst. And I remember we were hanging out, we were eating, we were all of us kind of drunk. And kind then of. you just bought what was I don't know what you just bought. So a I pair bought of kicks. these. You bought those. Yeah, How much yeah. you pay for those? At the time, this is At like the time. It was like a lot of money. <laughs> this is oh four oh five oh yeah. five when they came out. Yeah, yeah, oh five. I would say a, like a G or something, right? I paid eight hundred bucks. Eight hundred. And my wife was like, "The only reason I'm letting you buy them is because you won that tournament." <laughs> yeah, and we were eating, and he was eight hundred dollars for a pair. Of shoes I'm sorry, they came out two thousand two. Sorry. Yeah, no, these had already been out for okay. a while. These these were new, but I bought them off a of flight club for eight hundred bucks. <laughs> That's cheap. Now. Cheap. At the time, it was like, damn, dude, you paid how much? You but know? I remember being shocked that you were wearing it at Tua Club. Yeah. You know, like, because we were afterwards. I had no and fear like, about that. And I was like, yo, you wearing this shit afterwards? Yeah, and they still the look clubs? new as fuck as he's wearing them. I take good care of them, man. No, man. Yeah. Yeah. So you got that from AM? Uh, yeah, like, I got the bug from, well, okay, so we were all collecting vinyl. It was all about like what the other guy didn't well, have. This is the thing. You guys were all collectors. Yeah. That's we were, really what it was too. That's half of it. The other half of it was, I want to have some shit that you don't have. Right. Whether that was a record or whatever. And AM had a lot of records and he had a lot of shoes and he was, he would definitely let you know, mm -hmm. uh, here's some shit you don't have. And he was notorious to buy two pairs yeah. He'll keep one on ice and he'll wear one to whatever the fuck. For the big ones, yeah. Yeah. But he also was not afraid to wear his shoes. No, you yeah. Know? No. Um, so, you know, w the first time I met him, I walked in his house, there's this wall of sneakers, you know, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. oh, shit. The this famous guy, wall. <laughs> yeah, this guy's serious, yeah, you yeah. know? And he would remind me of shit I didn't have. So I was like, well, I better get some shit then, you know? And that carried through, you know, um, it was records and then everything went digital. So I was like, well, what are we going to collect now? So then it became shoes and vintage rap tees. Yeah, vintage tees. Or vintage tees in general. Like we I collect mean, all of them. Let, let's be honest. Like the real big thing was the vintage rock tees. Because uh, like, if you had a Guns N' Roses tee right. or if you Metallica. had like. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Because yeah. it was so, like hard to get that shit. And right. it was like the beginning of like the vintage hard like rock and roll tee shit. Before like 
before even the 2010s. No, like, before, yeah, before I got famous like, recently. It, like, if you had a Guns N' Roses tee or like a fucking Single the police or, or anything like that, it was right. like, it was dope. Those know? are the ones that were worth a lot of money yeah. you know, originally. And then, you know, rap tees. I mean, a lot of the early rap tees that I got, I paid like 30 bucks on eBay for them. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? The rap tees Jesus. were like still under the radar yeah. a little bit. Like, totally. no one gave a fuck about that. Only thing. certain ones, but mm -hmm. it was a very small amount of those. It was yeah, mainly yeah. the rock tees, like you're saying. But yeah. we were collecting, the same way we would collect music, we were collecting all of them. Right. So it was like an open format vintage collection. Collection, you know what I mean? Yeah, I had yeah. some electronic tees. I had some hip hop tees. I had some rock tees. Festival like, tees. I just collect, and I still to this day I collect them all. Anything that I like musically, I'll, I'll you know try to collect a yeah, You were telling me that you, uh, you were even talking to Ross One. You gave him a couple tees for the the new rap tees book too. Yeah. So yeah. so Ross just dropped rap tees too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was I helped him with the first one too. Yeah. And so um, yeah, I mean we're both collectors, and so he put some of my tees in both of those books. And if you guys <laughs> like, if you're interested at all in you know, vintage rap tees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ross is the man. Yeah. And the book is incredible. It's like just an encyclopedia so of all the best stuff. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's a true expert and collector. Like he yeah. knows everything yeah. about the tees. And that's one of the, you know, things that like I'll talk to him about like, hey man, you think this tee's legit? And he kind of does the same thing with me. What do you think about this one? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, there's a lot of like uh, <laughs> the shit that's legs, not. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot because the tees are worth a lot of money. So there's a lot of people that are making them that aren't legit. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's part of the game now is like identifying which ones are. Yeah, it comes real. down to like label stitching, all the, like the single stitch. That's right. Yeah, the single the stitching or what the tag is. The giant tag, all yep. the shit. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot to it, man. Yeah. Ross will dig in with you on that for Ross sure. Ross is just like a complete nerd with the culture in general. Like he's, he the, I mean, he's like a, a monster with flyers. I think he, yep. like, he yeah. wants to even come out with a flyer book. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, have he, you, if he could. Have you seen his collection, his collection of flyers? Is crazy. It's incredible. Yeah, it's yeah. insane. Yeah. Like, yeah. he has like. Maybe one of the first hip hop flyers ever. Like he has all, the, he has a lot of shit. He really does. And yeah. he, the thing is, is he lives it, man. Like I mean, he knows that his he's knowledge not, like, of hip hop is crazy. crazy and the history. Yeah, is I don't know any other fucking white boy like him. That, <laughs> maybe Shecky. Maybe Shecky. Yeah, Shecky. Shecky. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, Ross and Shecky. I mean, in a room just talking about the history of hip hop, like That'd it's be crazy. Insane. Yeah, we those just guys gave you an idea for out. your next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> gotta do with those two. Yeah, I gotta get. I gotta get uh, Shecky Ross, and then like, like maybe one more, maybe like someone like Stretch or somebody. There you like, go. Just to sit and just talk about and just nerd out. Yeah. On all that shit. That'd yeah. be great. I'd be into it. You so you're you've been collecting all this shit with with AM, and you guys are close. Like, and then you guys kind of just stay tight, just like over the years. Yeah, we did. Uh, I mean, well. You know, the first time I saw him DJ, that was a revelatory experience. Mm. Um, I, he invited me out to Body English. He had just kind of started there. It was, you know, early days there in Vegas. Yeah. And I uh, went out there and that was nuts, like, to me. Because he was just playing records that, like, I just no other DJs were playing. Mm -hmm. I remember walking in and he's, like, doing a doubles routine with no doubt. Uh, hella good. Do you remember that? Yeah, record? yeah. And it's like with the bass line and everything and I'm like, it's the middle of the club and this is on real vinyl. This is just before he made the switch to Serato mm -hmm. and he was he was doing stuff like that and he was playing just these really random records and making it work and getting these huge reactions and I'm like, this dude is just a different, different he, animal. He just really, he really perfected the art of bringing turntablism and making it palatable right. in a nightclub setting that I don't think and then selecting these records that no one would play right from like Rent to, and, and you know he's one of the first few that I heard that made Journey work you know like Phantom Planet California yeah. The Outfield Your Love right mm -hmm. like these records were not records other people Oasis really Oasis, 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 Oasis right. you know the thing is like we, we played a lot of rock and a lot of the shit in New York mm -hmm. but it wasn't played the way AM did it with, with like you know having like breaks drum breaks under oasis right. and That's scratching so that beat over it right and just creating like this this completely new song live in front of everybody That's it right. was it was almost like he was implementing like a, a bit of like a like an edm house energy because yeah he, he would create these build-ups and then like scratch it out and and he know. also incorporated like pop culture into a lot of right. the stuff too he made um, it really digestible Right, really, and and it, it you know it opened the doors for everything, and a lot of stuff was happening for him really fast. Two thousand four, two thousand five, things were moving, and one of the things that was coming up was he was opening a nightclub 
in Hollywood. LAX. LAX. Mm -hmm. uh, that was named by Nicole because it looked like an airport. <laughs> it was very cold interior, mm. you know, kind of all gray, you know. Um, and we were walking through a Fry's Electronics. He was looking for gadgets. He was a big gadget guy. And he was looking for this. He wanted this little printer that he'd be able to print his Southwest Airlines uh, <laughs> boarding pass from, you know. He wanted to be able to do that on the road. He didn't want to have to, you know, go to a kiosk or whatever, right. you know. So he wanted that. So we're walking through the aisleways and he's like, hey, man, you know, uh, I'm, I'm opening my club you know, at the end of summer, LAX. I was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, I still haven't seen it. You know, that's cool. Mm -hmm. You know, because it was kind of hush-hush. Like he, he'd mentioned it, but it, nobody really knew that much about it. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, I want you to be the resident. Oh, shit. Oh, I was shit. like, wow. And just prior to that, he had come down to off-campus mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and had seen me DJ. And he was, he was asking some questions that night. And he was like, so is it always like this? Always this packed? You know, I was like, yeah. And he's like, you always have a line out the door? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, and you're here every Thursday? And I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, wow. So that's yeah. cool, you know? And I think that was what he was looking for, like a resident who could hold it down on a regular basis. Because mm -hmm. I hadn't played in L.A. up to that point. I was just an OC guy. Right. Mm. And uh, so that day, he, like, asked me to be the resident at the club. And I was like, shit, yeah. Hell yeah, of course. Who's going to say no? In right? the middle of Fry's Electronics. So <laughs> it was. they were going to be open three days a week. They were going to be open on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. And Wednesday was going to be his night. And he did it with Bolt House, which is uh, Brent Bolt House and Jen Rosero. They own the bungalow now. And mm -hmm. they're, they're legends in the you know uh, LA nightclub world. Um, and he was going to do their night. They were promoting Wednesday. AM was going to DJ. And he wanted me to do Friday. And then I think originally it was going to be Samantha Ronson was going to do Saturday. Because uh, Samantha and AM were, were close. And for whatever reason, the Samantha thing didn't happen. So he was like, okay, I'm going to do Wednesday, and you're going to do Friday and Saturday. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. You know? So I started doing Friday and Saturday at LAX. And that was um, just a crazy club, man. I mean, it was so many stars. And that was the time period where, um, you know, it was early reality TV. Right. Okay. So you had all those people there from like the Hills, the yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it was like, you know, it's like Misha Barton, Lindsay Lohan, you know, Paris Hilton. Yeah. All those people. And then you'd have legitimate stars too. Like Prince would be there and Jamie Foxx was there like every Friday. Yeah. yeah. So it was, and I had not spun for stuff like that before. So it was like, oh shit. Yeah. It's kind of, was that like the birth of like TMZ too? And like yeah, this is that 05. Time, right? It's like yep. fire crotch time, yeah. right? Yeah. TMZ hanging out in front of like all the fucking velvet ropes and all the That's LA right. Hollywood clubs just they, to see who's walking in, walking out. Right. Who I hooked like, up together. Yeah. Who's leaving right? together. Yeah. When you would leave the club, it would just be a sea of cameras. Yes. With the lights on the top and you'd be right in your face. Very different than now. Like, no, I mean, yeah. You don't have that shit yeah. really that much. But at that time, that was all new. Yeah. You know, and that was what was happening. It was AM's club, which is a big reason why. And um, so I was doing that club for the first like year or so. And around that time, uh, right when I first started, I met Spider uh -huh. and Steve Wonder. And they were just kids. Yeah. They didn't have gigs yet or anything like that. But they did a couple mixtapes that they gave to AM. Mm. And I saw them at AM's house. I'm like, who's this? You know, and all oh, these, these two kids, man, they're, they're like the next up and coming kids. And um, so I was doing like a private party at LAX. For Nicole Richie was, um, she was sponsored by Bongo Jeans. Oh. So I was doing like a Bongo Jeans party and AM and Nicole <laughs> were there and I had to DJ and, you know, there's a bunch of people there. And, and here's Spider and Steve Wonder off in the corner just by themselves, kind of like with their right. arms folded like this. And they walked up to the booth and they're like, hey man, just wanted to introduce ourselves, you know, whatever. And I go, oh, I know who you guys are, you know. I saw your mixtapes at AM's house and they were like, what? You know, and right after that uh, was when Spider won that contest next on the decks. I was going to yeah. ask, yeah. He won that contest and he got to go play at Mansion with uh, Mark Ronson and right. AM. And so he started getting a bunch of gigs and they were they were kind of putting him all around the country for this next on the decks thing. Yeah, this is when Spider and like Steve Wonder were wearing like the Rogue Status hoodies. Yeah, like, we like, all were. Yeah, yeah Rogue <laughs> With the machine guns all over. Yeah, yeah. With the yeah. machine guns. Oh, you know what? Yeah, yeah, star. The, the all over print shits. Yeah. I have yeah. a really funny story about that actually. <laughs> I have the picture too. We'll, we'll put it in the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So one time I was wearing that Rogue Status shirt. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was with Mello D and we yeah. were at LAX. I don't remember what the party was. <laughs> and Suge Knight was there. Oh, shit. And me and, me and Mello were like, let's go get a picture with him. <laughs> and so we walk up to Shug and we're like, yo, can we get a picture or whatever? And so he's standing, he's got stogie in his mouth. He's, he's super tall. If you yeah, yeah, he's, he's literally tall. got his arms on our shoulders and he's towering over us, right? And we take the picture and he's just, you know, he's got the cigar hanging out of his mouth. Yeah. And he turns and he looks at me and he goes, hey man, I really like that shirt. 
<laughs> it was the road yeah, yeah, it had the guns road. on it. And I was like, oh shit, you know, it's like AK forty seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just an imprint. <laughs> but Suge, Suge liked that shirt. So that uh, yeah, so that's the era. The yeah. era is like the rogue status era. Or whatever. Yeah. And I think around that time, uh, AM kind of got the idea like he was getting booked so much out of town, like we should leverage this. He finally had a manager. Prior to that, he'd been doing all his own bookings. Mm -hmm. He got a manager. Uh, and so- That was LV, right? LV, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, they hadn't started Dexter yet, but they were booking Spider at a lot of rooms. And they were booking Homicide at quite a few rooms, I believe, right. at that time. Mm -hmm. And we should turn this into something, you know, because AM's getting so many requests, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, and I'm at LAX, so I'm, you know, to them, I'm marketable at this point because yeah. LAX is a club that's in like a lot of the, the tabloid, you know, stuff that's going on, like Us Weekly and shit like that. Yeah, they because at that time, there. yeah, at that time, like it was really about PR. It was right. about getting mentioned like on page six in the in New York uh, Post or like in the, you know, in the tabloids, or, like you would say, you know, Nicole Richie left uh, LAX you know, and danced all night to the sounds of DJ Kevin Scott. Right. So yeah. if you got like your name mentioned in the newspaper, right. It was just like one of those. That was that was a way of, of marketing for DJs. Yeah. That was kind of the way. The way. At that the was time. a yeah. shout out on it on social media. I mean, I remember that. motherfuckers was paying PR motherfuckers. You know, you you, get, yeah. you would get work from that. For yeah. Sure. And um, so they started Dexstar, and I was one of the first guys on Dexstar. So they started sending me out to different gigs, you know, all over the country. I think at like one point I was doing like eleven monthlies like all around the country. Yeah, Damn. Uh, Atlantic City, we did, you know, Miami, we did, oh gosh, Pittsburgh, Detroit, like everywhere, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Bay Area, we did a bunch of stuff in San Francisco. It, it was it was crazy though. Like I've heard stuff like, there was like a Dexstar formula though, right? Like, What do you mean? So like AM was in such high demand yeah. that if like, I heard there was this thing where it's like, if you wanted to book AM, you had to book like a couple people off of Dexstar kind of right it became that yeah yeah and it was like uh like yeah if he if he had a monthly residency somewhere it would be i don't know how much am's rate would be but it would be for a certain amount a lot a lot and then they would be like well in order to secure this residency right you have to book however many djs off of the roster and it yeah. became this like formula but what i loved about it was that am was always looking out for his peoples right and then, like, kind of planting a, a seed in it. Well, I think initially with the original Dexstar lineup, yeah, uh, he was very much into having a diverse group yeah. of guys that he really believed in. Mm -hmm. That was important to him. Like, I want guys that are all a little bit different that bring something to the table, so that every time they're at this city or this club, it's like a new experience. But they're good at what they do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because if you really look at that original lineup, we're all very different from each other. We're yeah. talking about the original lineup where you guys are. Uh, it's like scene. Yeah. Spider, Steve Wonder, mm -hmm. Fashion, um, Morse Code, AM, Morse Code. Is it Ellie Escobar? Ellie. Yeah. So there was a like a um, I don't want to call it a subdivision, but there was a group of, that were more like electronic based, which would have been like you know Steve Aoki, Them Jeans, right? Uh, Pace Rock, mm -hmm. Ellie, um, and then there was like more of the open format mashup guys. So they were kind of doing two different sets of rooms, basically, mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. But yeah, that's all part of the original crew. That's the original pictures that we took. It was like it was it was crazy because it, the scene was kind of small. The community was small. Yeah. So like you know, I, I think at the time I had my own management, and then there was Scam Artists, and then there was like Dexstar. Right. But and like, there was one other that was in uh, the East Coast. I yes, think it was. It was uh, something 360. Yes, uh, Mood Swing. Mood Swing. Mood Swing 360. And yes. that's what the, like Riz right. and Scissor Hands and all So it was things. those three were kind of the... We were like in rotation, but it was very small. But like when we were making money, we were all making money. Oh, yeah. But it was a lot had to do with AM. It did. You know, it's like even 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 though like AM had Dexstar, yeah. they still, the idea of the mashup DJ and then like the celebrity mashup DJ and booking a, a mashup DJ was like really am. And then he dictated the rates, you know, yeah. to, to a certain degree. So like if his money went up, all our money went up. Right. Mm -hmm. it, which the, is crazy. It would leak over to even me. Yeah, he's you know? the, he was the North Star, right? Right. So he was the guy. And he was breaking barriers mm -hmm. constantly. I mean, he was doing things that nobody else had ever done. No one, no one to this day, right? to this day, for open format, no one has done what he's done. No. There was no one after him. Mm -mm. No. Yeah, and, and I think that's the crazy shit, you know? We, I mean, we should really review, like, what, what did he do, right? Right. Like, 
he did so many big things. He was the first DJ that I knew that like opened his own club. It was a huge hit. Mm -hmm. He took that, parlayed that into an LAX in Las Vegas right. at a major casino, which was actually Raw, where mm -hmm. Warren Peace and Mr. Robin so. played before. Yeah. Right? He was in a Nike commercial because he loved Nikes. He was in a Nike Crazy. commercial with Kobe Bryant. And Mike Epps. And Mike Epps. Yep. He was in a hit television show, Entourage, mm -hmm. yep. as himself. Yeah. yeah. Not as a DJ, but as a shoe collector. Yep. yep. Right? He was in a major motion picture. Iron unfortunately, Man. came Iron out Man. after he passed away, right. which, which I was involved in. Uh, Iron Man 2. After, yeah, yeah, Iron Man 2. And he originally was just supposed to be in the background of that movie. And he ended up having a speaking role in it because they all liked him so much. But right. AM is in the Marvel, uh, the MCU. Yeah. Like, yeah. That yeah. shit is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It John is. Favreau loved him. Yeah. 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 He did. John Favreau like heard him and he was well, like, oh, I, got, I got to put you in this movie. Big right. DJ guy. Yeah. yeah. And when AM passed away, they had, the film hadn't come out yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I got a phone call from John Favreau, which was a very surreal phone call. You know, mm -hmm. and he's like, "Hey, I know you and Am were close. He mentioned you a few times, and uh, I just I wanted to reach out because I want to keep him in this movie, but I need somebody that knows him to take a look at it and make sure it's okay." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. I went down to Marvel, and um, <laughs> he was like, "He showed me the footage." And at the time, he was like DJing in the footage, but he's like playing stuff that there's no way they could clear. It was like party breaks, and he's scratching, and he's right. like, "I need music for this. Will you do the music?" I'm like, "Yeah." I'll do so you music. did the robot the robot uh I did that mix. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, with yeah, the yeah. fighting. Yeah. War Machine and Iron Man. Yeah. So there was no music there initially. So we're hanging out at Marvel and John had an office and he had a DJ booth set up because he was really into DJing at the time. Yeah. Aim had like put the bug in him, man. Like yeah, he was yeah. into it, right? And he's like, bring your computer down. And so I got a DJ as John Favreau sitting in a couch, you know, so it's stressful. You know, and he's like, Well, what do you think? You know, he's like, Well, we've already cleared another one by the dust. Yeah. Right? Was, yeah. So that was like the starting point. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the starting point, right? 110 BPM roughly, yeah. you know? Okay, well, what can we do? I started thinking about it, and, you know, he showed me the scenes, two two robots fighting, and I'm Robot like, rock. why don't we do, like, It Takes Two, you know, Rob Bass, and then let's do Robot Rock by Daft Punk because oh, Daft right. Punk was AM's favorite. Right. Oh, my God. And so he's like, okay, cool. He's like, well, go home, put it together, put the mix together, and send it to me. So I went home, put it together, sent it to him, just an MP3, you know, just sent it to him via email. And he's like, this is perfect. And that's what's actually in the movie. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. And uh, he cleared that. And, uh, dude, the bill on that was $660,000. Jesus. Yeah. He's like, could you, the, the music, the guy who was doing all the music for the movie, he like hit me up. He's like, could you have picked three more expensive songs? <laughs> oh, sorry, man. Damn. Like, yeah, you killed our you budget. Paid, you paid essentially 200000 for each song because it was yeah, three. Two, yeah, that's right. That's Dude, you're in the MCU. One of your mixes is in the MCU. Yeah, and let me tell you. Forever. So I never went into a studio and properly recorded it. Basically, the MP3 I sent him is what's in the movie. Really? So I hadn't really thought about it that much until the premiere was coming up. And I was like, shit, I, I never really pro properly recorded it. So we go to the premiere, and it's at this huge theater on Hollywood Boulevard. And we're sitting there, and I'm sitting next to Aziz Ansari. <laughs> and like the you know, comedian. <laughs> yeah the comedian you know and i'm like I'm, you know we're watching the thing and the scene's about to come up and i'm just instantly start sweating because i'm like what if it sounds like shit right like it hadn't the thought hadn't occurred to me until that moment <laughs> you're like oh i should have gotten this master yeah right. and i'm like i'm like totally <laughs> terrified like this is gonna sound terrible and it comes and it passes and it's fine you know mm -hmm. and my wife looks she goes you can breathe now like, yeah everything's yeah. good you know and i was like oh shit you know but yeah i remember that that was that was pretty crazy you know but am did that too right in a major motion picture and he did he had sponsorships with like pepsi designed pepsi bottles like i mean the guy just he broke every barrier. Yeah, he was the first everything. Did he yeah. have for, a sidekick for, for us? You know, he had a sidekick skin. Yeah, sidekick skin. Right. Yeah, yeah, he did the that. Pepsi's. Uh, he had his own sneaker with Nike. Yeah, he had, uh, yeah. dude, and, and that he, that, you know. that 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 sneaker alone, like that, shit broke barriers for collaborations with artists and musicians because he's kind of one of the first ones to do that, and especially in a DJ pack with DJ Premier and then DJ Am. I mean, those vinyls and that whole setup alone is probably like twelve hundred dollars now. Yeah, and it's so hard to get. Sadly, it, it released after his death. But yeah, well, I'm you know, the guy just uh, made everything possible. And it's important to note too; he did this without ever producing anything. Mm -hmm. He did it strictly on the skill of putting records together, right? Yeah, that's crazy. That doesn't happen anymore. But he did have a record deal with Interscope, right? So 
No. Well, yes. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell that story then. Yeah. Okay, so (laughs) in in 2005, we, you know, we were hanging out a lot. Yeah. And he was getting hit up all the time. He was at Body English like, I need, people want a mixtape from me. I was like, well, let's make one. Me and you, let's make one. I know how to make those. Yeah. You know, let's make a (laughs) mixtape, right? So we go to his house and we're making, we're working on a mixtape. And he's, his idea is, I'm going to sell it for 40 bucks a piece at Body English. I'm just going to tax people for this. You know, like... (laughs) I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all my best routines and we'll just sell it, right? And we're making it. And as that's happening, he got some interest from Interscope like to make a mix CD. Mm-hmm. And uh, he got paid in advance. And they were like, yeah, we want to do this. And his thing was, I only want it to be classics because every time a mixtape drops, it's got current music on it. And by the time it comes out, it's outdated. Mm-hmm. It's already over. Like nobody yeah, yeah. cares, right? So I only want classics. So my job, so they, they hired me on to be like the producer for this mixtape with Interscope. And my job was like, they would, he would send me all his live mixes. And these are the live mixes that are now like on his mix cloud. Mm-hmm. He used to send these to me and I had to catalog every song that was on it like, and put in groups of which mixes of his were like classic mixes and which ones we wanted to put on this mixtape. And then Interscope would go and see if they could clear it. Like what if it was possible? Turns out not possible because right. everything he wanted to do, which was like Guns N' Roses, Michael Jackson, you know, all the classic AM mixes, classic artists, way too expensive. It wouldn't make any sense for Interscope to do this. And it would have been a logistical nightmare to try to clear all that. So it never happened, but he still got his advance. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And we tried to do it. And eventually um, the mix that he and I worked on, I released that on the 10 year anniversary of his passing because I had never mm. released that. So that's the one that's on the DJ AM Lives uh, mix cloud page. Um, so that's the one we worked on 2005 together. And it's like really the kind of that mix is the heyday of AM. It's it's all the mixes that really made him well known. Mm -hmm. So it's everything. It's like, you know, everything from Wonderwall to like all the classic routines that he was doing at that time, the early switch over to Serato and mashup era stuff. I heard he was trying, I heard there was a record deal like on the table, Mm -hmm. like rumors or some shit, but I heard like in the grapevine. But like, and he tried to figure out like production. I he worked think, with Ellie a few times. Yeah, he would they, fly mm-hmm. Ellie out. He would fly yeah. even Rock the Con out to like kind of figure out. So Ableton and I like kind of grasp what he wanted to do, but he just never uh, went through with it or just had the time for it. Or I, I think know. that's where it would have went. Yeah. Um, and I know him and Ellie did like a Green Day remix and mm-hmm. some other stuff, but like it, it just, it was kind of on the cusp of all that. Yeah. And, you know, look, he was a really, really busy dude. Right. I mean, unbelievably busy every day, had a million things going on. So like to, to carve out the time, it needed to be a worthwhile project because he was making a ton of money and, and a ton of demand. So like, if I'm going to go produce some stuff, it needs to be worth it. Now, knowing what we know now and the direction that everything was going, the fact that he was breaking these barriers all the time, he would have figured out eventually, I need to make records, whether that would have been through you know a proxy or mm-hmm. somebody helping right. him right mm-hmm. or whether that would have been himself but he was a very creative musical dude and he would have eventually figured that out right but he hadn't really got into that and so all these things that we're talking about he did that without that he did that just playing commercial music mm-hmm. which is crazy i mean well he was he was kind of leading the way with banana split with like uh, with dance music too right. and, and his mm-hmm. love affair with like daft punk House i mean Blog. he was pushing electro he's pushing baltimore club he was pushing all of this like new music that was a uh, that was outside of like whatever was going in top forty uh, and everything. So he was at the time like leading it like that way, and I, I could see him maybe you know producing some dance right. music in the future. You know, that's what he was into. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I like to say he he shifted culture twice in the DJ community and music mm. community. So the first time he did it, he switched kind of everything to mashup. I don't like to say open format so much because. You know, in the 90s, I, I was playing open format. Yeah. I mean, he was doing it differently, obviously, but the mashup culture, the mashup era, yeah. People, some people call that open format, uh, the mid-2000s, he shifted everything to that. Pretty soon, everybody was playing that, right? Yeah. And then he shifted it again with all the stuff he was doing with Banana Split and Steve Aoki. Right. And then everything went that direction after his passing. Everything was EDM. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he, in my mind, he was the guy that's, that made that shift because we were all kind of watching what he would do. Yeah. Everybody did. Everybody watched. That was a commercial DJ. Everybody watched what AM did. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's just how it was. I mean, one of his legendary sets is at, is at 2009 EDC. Yeah. And that, I mean, I wish there was a recording of that because Me it's too. really just snippets of it. Mm-hmm. But he was ahead of his time bringing in just all genres in one place. And then hit, that crowd was just going bananas for everything he played. If it was 
up tempo EDM, if it was low rider, whatever he was playing, like it was just like it just clicked together so wonderfully. Yeah, he had a real ear, man. Like he knew. How how did you um you know when AM passed? Yeah, and uh, how did you become kind of the liaison to a lot of his? I don't know like IP or like you know what I mean yeah. like you you became the the liaison and the representative for a lot of his yeah. you know a, a lot of his work and a lot of his belongings and you were kind of like um, I don't know like a, a buffer or you know a person that was like navigating it with his mother and trying yeah. to coordinate everything and and you put together this documentary mm. and you were gathering footage and you, you became like you know the protector the yeah. guardian of of everything AM. Uh, how did that like happen? You know? It wasn't it, it wasn't a conscious decision. Yeah, it just sort of happened because nobody else was really doing it. I don't remember the year, but at some point before they started the movie, I got together with Shecky. I've known Shecky a long time, mm -hmm. um, and right after he passed away, his assistant had given me an AA speech that Adam had given. He had like had a recorder like in his pocket and recorded AM. AM wanted him to, but he had recorded him speaking at an AA event. And he hit me up on Facebook, and he's like, I feel like you should have this. Mm. And he sent it to me, and I was like, I don't know what to do with this, you know? Because that's not, I didn't, I didn't really know. Like, AM was very compartmentalized. So, like, if you were his DJ homie, you talked to him about music and stuff. You didn't talk to him about addiction or drugs. Or, and then he had that side of him, too. He had two different sides, right? He was a DJ, right. but he was also helping people with addiction. So I didn't really know that. No, part. you're absolutely right, because there's, there's a, a few, a handful of DJs in our community that, you know, that went to AA and they were, you know, they were, they were addicts, they were previous right. addicts, but they were very close with AM. And AM always was very adamant about speaking with anyone that was uh, dealing with any addiction That's issues right. or problems. Yeah, big He'd part be like, of call, call me, no matter what, yeah, let's talk. He was talk. a sponsor. For yeah, a he was a sponsor for so many DJs. Yeah, he was. And he and he was very accessible. Right. Like, he was not, like, Hollywood or, or bougie about any of that shit. That's right. So that was a completely different side. Right. Yeah. And so he's, he gave me this recording, and I didn't really know what to do with it. And Shecky and I had gotten together at his place out in Vegas. I'm like, somebody needs to make a movie, you know? And I go, somebody passed me this. I feel like this could be like the, the narration for it because mm -hmm. it's AM story in his own words, but the, but the audio sounds terrible. Right. And um, so we listened to it and, uh, and Shecky was like, yeah, that totally is it. But then that was it. That, nothing came of it. Mm -hmm. Well, as it turned out, um, Kevin Kerslake, who directed and wrote the AM documentary, As I Am, Life and Times DJ AM, that I, that I helped, uh, right. that I co-produced and, and worked on the music with, um, he was commissioned by the family to make the film because of the EDC movie that he made where he did a tribute to AM in the middle of that movie. Mm -hmm. And um, so the family was like, this is the guy that we want to do this. And so he started making the movie and he was going in chronological order. So he was starting with like his childhood friends and stuff. And Shecky was involved in it already. Right. And Shecky had hit me up and he's like, yeah, this, is, this thing's happening. Um, I'm like, okay, is he going to contact me? You're like, how's this going to work? He's like, yeah, he'll, he'll contact you. And so Kevin Kerslake contacted me and we did a couple interviews. And um, th that if you don't know anything about him, he's like the guy for 90s alt rock videos. Mm -hmm. He was working, he did all the videos for Nirvana other than Smells Like Teen Spirit. He was mm -hmm. working with Kurt Cobain when he died on a film. Wow. He did, I mean, the, his list is crazy. All the big, really cool 90s alt rock videos. And then he's also done a number of documentaries. He did one for Bob Marley, the Ramones, mm. like he did the EDC one. So he was a really interesting guy. And like, he really got it. Like he's, he's very, he's just a very artistic, smart, wants to get it right guy, you know? So we did the interviews and then I didn't hear from him for like a couple months. And it was, I was like, man, they're, they're making something about my friend. And like, I wonder if it's going good or not. Like, right. I don't know how this thing's going. So I would just check in with him. And one time he's like, you know, you're really interested in this. You can come down to the edit bay and check it out. So I go down to the edit bay and he had his editor, this guy, Joel Marcus, great, great dude. And they're editing this, all this footage and they're showing me some of it. And it's really good. And they get to this one scene where they use Wonderwall in the movie. And all they have is the, the camera of him. He's playing at Aura in Pleasanton. Is that a place you ever played? Yeah, I've Aura heard of it. I've heard of it, yeah. It's a, I think it, the, the late, great Solomon had recorded this video from the DJ booth yeah, of AM. Peace, from the rest Bay. Peace, yeah. That's right. Great guy. He introduced AM to Serato too. 
Yeah. I mean, for real. Yeah. So he's in the booth because I think he opened that night. He's in the booth with AM and, and uh, AM's doing the Wonder Wall routine, but it sounded all distorted. You know, AM had the monitor so loud, so right. it sounded completely distorted. It sounded like total crap. And Joel Marcus, the editor, was like, you don't happen to have like, you know, uh, some audio of him doing this that sounds a lot cleaner. Yeah. And I go, and I played at Pleasanton a lot at Aura, and I knew that that's that club. And I'm like, you know, I have a live mix from Aura, you know? And, you know, he played there a lot. Yeah. Like, he probably played there like 25 times. I mean, that place got famous because AM was there. Right. Yeah. But I had this one recording, and like, so I, I was like, yeah, let me, let me look through it. It's like a three-hour recording, and I find where he plays Wonderwall, and it just so happened that that recording was from the night of that video. Really? That's wow. Crazy. And we put it in, and it was perfect. And from then on, he's like, you can come down anytime you want wow. to the edit bay. So I started coming down to the edit bay because I'm like, they're making a movie about my friend. I want it to be good. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want to give them insight. I want to make sure that, you know, they're talking to the right people, all that kind of stuff. And that turned into basically becoming a producer on the, you know, the film and then also trying to help them get interviews. So I helped them get interviews with Jazzy Jeff and Je John Favreau, Ben Baller, mm. people that I knew um, that they didn't have yet. And that's kind of how that started. And then it just kept growing. You know, Kevin and I, you know, became good friends and like really, you know, we're working on this thing, trying to make the best possible thing we could, the, the most honest, truthful thing we could make mm -hmm. about AM that mattered. And then the film came out and we did, I think like 40 cities. Mm -hmm. We did, uh, you know, theatrical and we would do Q and A's and stuff like that after. But it became hard for me because it was like going to his funeral every night. Right. <sighs> And I was I mean, like, that documentary is it's heavy. It's I, heavy. I love like the first half. Right. The first half is nostalgic. Right. You know, and it's kind of like how you want to remember AM. Right. And then the second half is just like, it's Dark. Just like, it just rips your heart out. Right. Yeah. By design, by Kevin's yeah, design, yeah. right? But it was very hard to always watch it. Like mm -hmm. I was like, man, this is, so, you know, people just would come out of that movie like wrecked, like yeah. wrecked. I went to the and, LA one. Did you guys have that, uh, I think, I forget, Ace Hotel? Yeah. I, I had to step out a few times because it was a little overwhelming. Yeah, of how I'll never forget when Rock the Con's on the in the documentary and he says, um, or I forgot who it was. He said, "You could be going to my funeral a week from now." Or he wanted to go into like on this like bombshell and do all this drugs and all that shit, and then it happens, and then you're like, I, it's a little overwhelming of a feeling because you see right. this guy as a superhero and. And then there's this whole dark side to it. Right. And it's very difficult to digest, especially you just see how great he is, and then it's just the, the pitfall. Right. And so, you know, we put the movie out. The movie was a critical success. Still has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. Um, and, you know, the movie was out, and it was kind of like, okay, like, I can, I can rest. There was another guy that was running an AM tribute page. Yeah. I felt like I had given what I needed to give Mm -hmm. Right, you just I wanted had, to make sure that the story that's was right. told correctly. That's right. right. And, it, and it got out and it was done. Yeah. Right? right? And then a series of crazy things happened after that, which was the guy who was running the page, the tribute page for AM, yeah. got in an accident and got amnesia. And he forgot all his passwords. He forgot he was even running an AM page. He, I don't even know that he really even knew who AM was after this accident. Mm. So there was nobody keeping the legacy alive on social. I had these hard drives full of all of Ames' memories, pictures, all the stuff we did for the movie, right. plus his hard drives, everything. I'm like, dude, nobody's nobody's going to keep this alive, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when COVID hit, I started getting messages on that page, the DJ Am Lives Instagram mm -hmm. page. I came in. I want to watch the movie, but it's not on Amazon. It's not on iTunes. It's not anywhere. And I'm like, what? Like that was news to me. Come to find out the distribution on it had lapsed. The family let it go, just mm. let it die, which is a no-no. Right. And uh, so I reached out to Kevin Kerslake. I was like, hey, do you, are you aware of this? And he's like, I am not aware of this. So he negotiated something with the family to take over the rights to the movie. And he's like, we need to re-release it. He goes, but since we own all the rights now, let's do what we always wanted to do. Let's tell the stories we want to tell. So I started thinking about that, and I pitched him the idea. I said, well, listen, the, the hard part for me was – Every time I watch the movie, it's like going to his funeral. And really what I wanted to do was just something on his DJ career. Right. The lighter side. Mm -hmm. I said, let me do a feature on DJ AM, the artist. And you do a feature on Adam Goldstein, the addict. <gasps> okay. And we will do like series bonus features. Yeah. 
and we can do whatever we want. The movie already exists, mm -hmm. so we can make these you know, sub-chapters. So that's what I did. So I made a three-hour bonus feature in three parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all about AM's DJ career yeah. from start to finish. So all of his early influences, mm -hmm. all the things that got him into music when he lived in Philly, and then when he moved to LA, his first experiences with turntables. Yeah. And then his ascension. It's the, very extensive. It's very extensive. From yeah. His, and like literally like his childhood. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And the reason for that is because in preserving his legacy, the best way to do that is to really trace it from beginning to end. If mm -hmm. somebody's really inspired by this guy, wants to know more about him, then let's just give him everything because we have no time constraints. Right. We have all of these interviews, hundreds of hours of footage. Like, let's do something. A lot of like a lot of his homies in Philly, mm -hmm. a lot yep. of like DJs, Cosmo Baker. Yeah, like, Cosmo's of, great. In yeah, it. Cosmo's amazing. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, because you sent me a link with like all of these, this new footage. Right. And I was, you know, I was going through some of it. But I was like, you know, when I was going through it, there's an extended version of the documentary That's that correct. I saw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, like you said, DJ Am the Artist, which is three hours. Yes. That's and my project. That's yeah. your project. And uh -huh. then it was The Attic. But I, I was watching some of the, the artist, and I was just like, this is what I wanted to see. Right. Because it's just, you know, it's just, you just think back to when he was a DJ and what influenced him and, and how he was and right. all the crazy fun stories of him coming up and blowing up and, right. you know, him just like, you know, it's like he didn't really give a shit about a lot of it. He just kind of wanted to make money. Like, right, if you're going to pay me, like, I'll fucking do it. That's right. Yeah. You know? But then there are certain things that he would do, and he would do it for free, which was amazing about AM. Right. To me, like, he did whatever he wanted. But it's like, if you want to do something, you just, just pay me enough, and I'll do it. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. But he's the type of DJ at his caliber who would still do, like, an Ellie Escobar local bar in New York mm -hmm. with, right. like, 50 people there. Yep. And he'll DJ there for free. Yeah. Well, and he that, he did you know, that. I talked him into a few of those too. Yeah. Matter of fact, my buddy Albie, I was telling you earlier about the LRG balloons. Or Al, yeah, Albie. He Shout did. Out to Albie, yeah. yeah, Albie the man. Yeah. So he had an '80s party. He was doing in Laguna Beach. Yeah. Every Tuesday, and it was the jump off down there. I mean, it was like all '80s, you mm -hmm. know. And Am and I really bonded over '80s music. We loved '80s music. Yeah. That was our thing. You know, we were always like, oh, you know this one, you know this one, you know, right. like rare '80s new wave tracks right mm -hmm. and uh so i was like yeah man albie does he knew albie i was like albie uh does this 80s night on tuesdays in laguna and am fucking drove all the way down there from la it's like an right. hour and a half he did that twice mm -hmm. came down there unannounced and played for like you know 150 people yeah. and he loved it and he loved it you know he just loved to play music well he loved it he you know he loved music and he loved djs yeah. he loved good djs yeah. and then mm -hmm. you know like i always tell like you know there's all these like these DJs that blow up, they get big, and then they they won't ever do like a, another DJ's party, right? You know, like one of the one of the things I would hear is like uh, I would hear like these these DJs tell me like, oh, I reached out to this dude, but you know his management said like, you know, <laughs> they you know we're not at the rate. What? And I'm just I would just be like, yo, like I don't get why some of these motherfuckers they they don't get it. Like this is about this is more than just the rate. Yep. Yeah. Like this is this is like culture. This is a community. Mm -hmm. Right. But AM got it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I, I just don't know where that got lost because it was so prevalent in the 2000s. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And then when he passed, I feel like- A lot of things fell apart. A, a lot of things fell apart. Yeah, they did. I feel like the soul died. Like the the pre, the importance of just community base for the DJ culture just flatlined. Like everybody forgot about everything. I think everybody kind of went their own way. Yeah. There was no longer this sort of guiding force, right? Everybody no kind of went their own way, and um, you know, and and things changed too. Musically, things changed. Yeah, for and sure. um, you know, I think things just started to splinter off, and um, it's a shame, man, because those were some fun times. And I feel like uh, heading into meeting AM and all the things that AM did, I don't think for me personally, I was a guy that was you know graduated college, I was going to go to law school, following my dad's <laughs> footsteps. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and. DJing was not a legitimate career. Of course not, yeah. It did not exist. AM legitimized DJing. He turned it into business. He turned it into something that not only could make you money, but could really be a part of popular culture in a big way. Yeah. And it, and it, and it had value. Because before it was just like, oh, that's something you're going to do while you're in college. How neat, you know? And then you'll move on and you'll get a job. Mm -hmm. But with AM, that was the job. And he made that legitimate in everybody's eyes. So effortless. I'm not saying he yeah. was the only one that did this. There's a lot of people that contributed to this. I don't want to 
you know, uh, paint an incorrect picture of that. But he was at that time the guy that really was sort of at the forefront of all of those things that were going on and yeah. really made it like my mom knew who he was. Yeah. I mean, we were all you rooting know? for him. Yeah. Like we, like when we saw him, we were proud, you know, cause we were like, yo, one of us made it. Yeah. And when I mean one of us, I mean like he was a broke kid, you broke, know? Mm -hmm. yep. broke fucking kid. It wasn't like nepotism. It wasn't like he came up under a celebrity or did all this shit. You know what I mean? Right. It, but it, he, he built everything from scratch, yeah. you know? And, and he, and when he came up, I remember just looking, I remember like just seeing him. I'm like, yo, that's, that's one of us. Like, he's just like a fucking club DJ. Right. He's not like a producer or like this, you know, whatever. He's just like literally a club DJ. And for the record, he never, ever claimed that he was the best. He would no. say the opposite of that. He loved DJs so no, much. No, he was like, Spin Bad's the best. Or yeah. he'd say, Craze is the best. I mean, he used to big everybody up. He right. used to, he like, he, I remember he told uh, DJ Reach in New York, he's like, I would give up some of my technical skill to have your mic game. Yeah. yeah. You know, like he... He was really a fan of DJs and the culture. He was. Yeah. He was. Yeah. He could, like, if you if you wanted to talk music with him, oh. he would sit there and talk music. Dude, I did that so many times until yeah. I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore. It was like falling asleep, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. six in the morning. He's like, yo, yo, you know this one? I'm like, oh my God. And you guys don't understand, like, <laughs> there was, it was such a different time. There was like a presence. I remember I was in San Francisco one time and I was with Solomon and we went to an after hour diner and something. And then it was me, Solomon, AM, and like maybe another DJ. And it was just four of us. And then in 10 minutes, there was like 30 people around us. Mm. And they just wanted like, a, just like, like one second with AM. Yeah. And it was like, you know, I'm just such a like New Yorker. So I was just like, yeah. I actually left the booth. <laughs> Jesus. And Christ. I sat with some other DJs. Yeah. But that's my whole thing with AM was like, I really like, like respected him and looked up to him. Yeah. Because I felt like he really was like a great representative for like club DJs. He you was. know? Yeah. And, but it was like, I always felt like I didn't want to, I don't know, like I didn't feel like I wanted to get to know him because everyone was just trying to get a piece of him. Yeah. And I just didn't want to be one of the motherfuckers to get a piece of him. like, Or to even look like I wanted to get a piece of him. So I was just like, let me just back the fuck off and like get out of this. like, Because everyone just wanted, there was, you know, there was a time where everyone just wanted like a, a picture or, or something yeah. with him and they wanted just like a piece of him. Be on top eight. <laughs> yeah. I think the thing about that, though, is like some of that is maybe your own perception of that because he wasn't really like that. No, like he if wasn't. You, if you, But I'm saying like you could go hang out with him. Yeah. And he, he didn't give two shits about any of that stuff. Like he mm -hmm. just wanted to like talk shop. What do you know about this? What do you know about that? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He liked to – those are the type of conversations that he liked. And if you were his homie, like all that other stuff, that's just noise. Yeah, you know what I mean. No, no, like, yeah, I, I and, totally uh, get what you mean, though. You and, know, but I know how it could be perceived that way by somebody watching it. But there's a lot of people that, like, you know, um, maybe felt that way. But well, I, don't, I, I didn't. I didn't think it was him. I thought it was like this wave of energy from other people you that just would kind of they would invade the space. And then I would just kind of like, let me get out of here because it's like. You don't want to look like another muncher or leech. Because I'm just, honestly, I'm just getting pushed. And like people are like, like I was literally at the diner and people were like pushing <laughs> to sit where I was sitting. Yeah. And I was just like. You got here first. <laughs> I'm like, you know what, man? Like, I don't need to sit at this table. Like, and like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to get none out of this. Yeah, so yeah. if we can't just kick it, you could sit here. Yeah. And like, you could do whatever the fuck you want to do with right. like in this scene. I didn't. I didn't you have know? that luxury because he'd be like, "Yo, don't stay here and make sure nobody's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, hassling me." Yeah, like, see, I wasn't. I wasn't even. You know, I wasn't. I wasn't that close to him. I was. I was in like a proximity of yeah. him, and um, and I was okay with that. You know right. what I mean? Because I didn't really, I didn't feel like uh, I I needed more because I was always I, I was already like really 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 kind of like well, a were, fan of what he what he did and i respected what he did you i mean know? you were already in the game though man you were like a jet you were already doing you were you were one of us you know uh, what i mean as far as we're concerned even if no no for like, sure wow, you were like for one sure. of yeah, us yeah. you know what i mean no no like no. oh crooked hold but, it down but you know there was a time where everyone would flex like oh me and am or like you know like yeah hey me and adam and they would like you know yeah, they would drop the I first name you know what i'm saying yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so it i was, mean it, it definitely was, was like you know he'd go play out of town people line up take pictures with him and yeah you know for sure um I don't know. I like. I never. I didn't pay that much attention to that. Yeah. But I know that that was happening. Yeah, yeah. I knew because I was in the outside proximity. So then I saw yeah, like yeah. everyone in the outside proximity. Right. A lot of people wanted a piece for sure. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was. It was. I mean, you know, the guy. I think that's just part of being 
a celebrity and like somebody who's like really kind of in in our world he was a full blown celebrity you know but that's how much of a presence he had where, dude like, he had you know, that presence walking into rooms with like right. stars yeah like he would do these huge parties like you know and there'd be like mega stars there and he was still like the guy mm -hmm. he's still the one that they hovered around yeah they would all fan, they would all fan out they would they would yeah and he had such a big voice and a big, bold personality. And yeah. he was very quick and very smart and very funny. Mm -hmm. And he knew, like, shit to say. And he knew what situations he was in. He knew how to, like, react to stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, like, man, it, it, it was magnetism, I guess, is the word, right? Mm -hmm. He was like a magnet for yeah, all yeah. that stuff. It's, it's so, with, with, this, with, the, with this website, that was, like, the tribute website. Yeah. You, how did you, hey, is that DJ AM Lives or did yeah. you rebrand it? Oh, no, it's DJ AM Lives .com is the website. Yeah. And then there's a Instagram page, DJ yeah. AM Lives. And then there's a mix cloud, DJ AM Lives. And the mix cloud is all the all his mixes that he did when he was alive and then some unreleased stuff that came after he passed. Instagram right now is mainly other people's tributes. Mm -hmm. um, it is hard for me at this point to, like doing this three hour project, on his DJ career mm -hmm. yeah. was like the one thing that I felt was missing to my contribution because the film is very heavy and I want to remember my friend as like a DJ and an artist and to give something that other people could be inspired by. Mm -hmm. So this was like my kind of like last contribution. All but right. it, but it's really and nice. So, it's like chronological the way it's yes, told. Right. It's from the beginning to when he first blew up to right. everything. It's like step by step. It's very, it's, it's well done. I, I put, thank you. Yeah. I put, a, I tried to put a lot into it. I wanted that to kind of be the, the one thing that I could point to for every DJ. Right. It's like, go, go watch this. You want to know everything? This is it mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the tribute page is mainly other people. Cause it's, it, it's hard for me at this point to continue to dig through the drives and like post new stuff. Wow. It's just, it's, there comes a point in time where for me as his friend, I want to kind of put an end to it. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it, it takes its toll yeah. uh, emotionally. I mean, you know, AM represents a great chapter for me, but it also is like such a terrible ending Yeah. that like I'm left with this void, you know, of like a good friend who ultimately the end was not a pretty thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, he was in a lot of darkness at the end. And it's like I was with him a week before he passed away. He did a gig in Orange County. Mm -hmm. I went to dinner with him and then went to the gig. And that was the last time I ever saw him. And a week later, he was dead. And I had absolutely no inclination that anything was wrong at all. He was the same old guy. Yeah. And so yeah, he was in New York. He like he threw like the the first pitch at the Mets game. Yeah, at the Mets game. I, I asked him how that went. And he goes, ah, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he didn't bounce it. So yeah, he said. I think his comment was like, at some point, right around then, Fifty Cent threw out a pitch, and it was like terrible. Or something. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. like, I didn't Fifty Cent it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it went know, sideways. Like, yeah, yeah, but um. So, you know, there, there's a point in time where it becomes hard for me to keep opening that door. So what I prefer to do is allow other, have that be the platform and allow other people to keep that alive, reposting their stuff and sharing stories mm -hmm. and things like that. And for people who, you know, are really interested in the whole story right now, it's at the djamdoc.com. It is, we are, we have self-published it. We will, we will put it back on all the major platforms like Amazon, iTunes, all of that. Right. Once Kevin completes the Attic series, he's releasing three more this week, actually. Really? He's going to do 12 uh, total episodes. They're a little bit shorter. Wow. That's, that one's probably going to clock in around three hours too. And that once that's done, then we can submit everything because when you submit to Amazon or iTunes, you have to submit the entire project completed. Mm -hmm. So once he completes it, we're going to go ahead and, uh, submit that and then it will be available on all the major platforms and we'll make you know try to get let everybody know about that but for now if you're interested in it it is available on on the djam doc yeah because the doc the extended version is two hours and then you have your three hours and then kevin's gonna have his three, three hours yeah, so it's yeah. literally eight hours of am yeah right yeah it's a lot. it's a lot it's a lot yeah but for like a dj nerd you know especially yeah. a, a young dj coming up who doesn't really know right you know his uh, impact they'll be it's amazing that's right and i mean out. you know it's like um there wasn't, you know, YouTube when he died was limited to like 10 minute clips. Uh, yeah. You know, Shaky so like, had the best one. Yeah, he did. Shaky had the best tribute. Which one was that? Uh, it, it has him uh, like on the crowd. He's surfing. That was the cover of it. But he had like mixes, the right. sneaker side, even with his cat, like all these great things. Yeah. And it was like um, him with a, with a, with a uh, beat, at, no, beat Boston 
or Orlando sucks, LAT, shit like that, all, yeah, yeah. all the undefeated shit. So he had the best one. It got taken down, but I hope, you know, somebody puts Probably it Probably because up. of music. Probably because of music. That's usually yeah. what happens. That's yeah. usually what happens. Yeah, I but mean, that's, you, that was the best one. You even telling me, I think, I, I would see you once in a while when you were working on the dock, and you were like, a, like maybe like a six months in or a, a year in, you were telling me one of the biggest issues was the music. Just getting everything. That's right. Getting everything approved. Yeah, so there's like there's two ways to do it for the doc. There's fair use, which mm-hmm. is if if somebody mentions something, you can use like a 15 second or less clip of that song. You don't have to clear it. It's right. considered fair use. But if you want to use, you know, more than that, then you have to get it cleared. And the issue with that is we wanted to use his mixes for the soundtrack, not original songs. Mm-hmm. So anything that we could find within his mixes, we wanted the soundtrack to be by AM. Right. Right. So you have to clear not one song, but whatever is playing underneath it or whatever else is going with it, right? So this creates a whole new set of issues. And um, we have, we had to do an Indiegogo, which is like Kickstarter yeah. campaign at one point in order to get the money together to get all the songs cleared. But the soundtrack on the film is very impressive, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've got a lot of cool stuff on there. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were able to get it all cleared. And uh, I think it came out really good because it, it feels like him. Like it, it feels like something that he would do like because it is something that he was doing yeah yeah yeah. so that i'm pretty proud of that i mean one of the ways we did that was um so we he was friends with daft punk's road manager mm-hmm. this girl sophia she's in the film uh and a couple of the parts and she did the alive tour she was like the road manager for the daft punk's alive tour and so you know my wife knew her and i knew her just from hanging out am's house and when the movie was going to come out we hit her up we're like, you think, you know, it's possible to get a couple of Daft Punk songs? Mm. You know? And she made that happen. Wow. And we got them for, a, I'm not going to say the price, but we got them for a very good price. <laughs> Compared and to we this. used that for everybody else. Like, well, you know, Daft Punk gave it to us for this price. Mm. Yeah. Right? And that really worked. Because wow. Daft Punk's very hard to get anything. Yeah, of course. For, they just don't use their music for a lot of that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. But they knew AM. You know, they had hung out with AM. I don't yeah. know if you know this, but did Mike B tell this story when he was on? Is it the Halloween one when when no uh, no no it's the one when the the night Obama got inaugurated no oh no he didn't tell us Daft me. Punk was at his house in his theater it was Mike B, A M and Daft Punk guys and Pedro um, from uh, Ed Banger Records mm. and they went over there I I think to watch like a documentary together and Obama was being inaugurated wow. and like A M's texting everybody you're never gonna believe this like Obama's being inaugurated right now. And Daft Punk's sitting in my house. <laughs> That's and that was like the biggest moment of his life, dude. Yeah. Like he's like, I've, I've made it. I'm done. Like, And that's actually in my three-hour thing. That it's Glenjamin. I don't know if you know who that is, but Glenn used to do shoot all the videos for um, Banana Split and stuff. Mm-hmm. Close friends with Mike B. And, um, and Mike, and uh, they're telling that story. And Sophia telling the story about how Daft Punk was at AM's house. That day, and that he was, was such like, a fan. Oh my oh, god, crazy. man! Yeah, he was such a fan. Like that was like every time I would see him around, though, that like, there was some type of conversation about Daft Punk. At one point, yeah, yeah. that became it. Everything, yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. It's like oh, I was, I was, I was, you know, I was with this chick, and then Daft Punk, and then I'm like, oh, I got these tickets <laughs> to Daft Punk. I yeah, like, oh, no, no. it was like <laughs> it's because when he went to see them play, it it brought out like some some energy inside of him that he'd never felt before. Yeah, yeah. That's it, the- it allowed him to be him. Mm-hmm. That's a story that yeah. Mike B says that he said, "Yo, I have tickets to a- to to Daft Punk, but if they're not VIP, I'm not going." Yeah, and then Mike B was like, "Don't be an asshole, let's That's go." Right. That's right. <laughs> he took me with him to the Vegas show, Vegas. It was at Vegas Festival, mm-hmm. and he took me to that. And uh, when it started, he was like so hyped. We were in this like middle. Here's the crowd, and you know those middle sections where it goes to like the the sound guy. The, yeah, the yeah, yeah. So we're in there. There's like a group of us. And the show started and he like grabbed my shoulder. Like, he's like, dude, you know, are you ready? And he grabbed my shoulder so hard. Like I had like a bruise. <laughs> I was like, damn, dude. You know, like that's how hyped he would get, you know, for this show. And, and like, he, I mean, he would dance the whole time. It was like, he finally didn't give a shit about trying to look cool. Right. He just was so into it that he let himself go. Mm-hmm. And I think that was like great to see, honestly. For Cause sure. he was very guarded and protected and he was a fat kid growing up. Mm-hmm. And so he had a lot of like kind of self-esteem and like, you know, wanting, you know, he he knew eyeballs were on him. So he was always kind of guarded, Yeah. but not at the Daft Punk show, man. He let loose, you know, and it was good to see, you know, 
when you were on Dexter and you guys were like, you know, on the road and everything, I, I kind of was always curious about this. You know, after like the the plane the plane crash accident with um, Travis Barker and AM, mm -hmm. like a, lo a lot of things changed with AM, obviously, and Travis Barker. Right. And then obviously when AM passed, a lot of things changed with Dexter as well. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, when that crash happened, did you, I mean, you know, you were really close with him. And um, it seemed like there wasn't enough downtime for him. Yeah. And it seemed like he was just kind of put back to work. I think at, at the time, and you know, it could be the opportunities that were on the table that he wanted to do. Because I think the crash happened and then like an opportunity to DJ for Jay-Z's like tour came up or yeah, something. Like three and, weeks out. And he did it. And then there were like these shows. But I kind of always wondered if you thought, you know, I don't know, like uh, if if there was a time when you just wanted to maybe just tell him, like, yo, maybe just chill or, or, or don't, don't well, do I, things. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I did, but you know, I'm, I'm just a friend. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, you can only I tell him so much, I can't stop him. You know. But we went to his house a couple of weeks after the plane crash. Um, he was still bandaged up. Mm -hmm. He was hurting. It was just I'm Mike. Mike B was there. I was there. There was a few other people. My wife, uh, his mom, and um, he brought it up. And he's like, hey, man, you know, like I could I could DJ for Jay-Z. Yeah. I'd have to get on an airplane, though. Mm. And I was like, dude, you can't do that. Like, there's no way. Why? You know, Jay-Z's not going anywhere. Like, And uh, we talked him out of it, talked him out of doing it. Like, he agreed that night. You know, you're right. Too soon. I was like, yeah, way too soon, you know. And he got up the next morning and called LV. He's like, I want to do this. Mm. So he, you know, he made the call. Um do I think it was too soon? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I also think I cannot even begin to imagine how much courage you have to have after going through that. Yeah. Get on an airplane again. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like what, how many people do you know have been in an airplane crash? Right. I mean, to survive it and then be like, yeah, so I want to go get on another airplane to go play for Jay Z. Obviously, the odds of it crashing are astronomical, but that's not really the thing, right? No. Like every memory and every horrific thing that you experienced is going to come back to the forefront the second you get to the airport. I mean, I think the crazy shit was there. There were pictures of him performing, I think, and then they, you, there were like scars, like burnt, you know. Yeah. His like, hair was you know, patched up. You know, and, but it seemed, the scars seemed fresh. You know, they, they were still were. pink and red. They and it was like. And I mean, there were, you know, there was always people talking and rumors like, you know, like, oh, like his management's making him do this or like, you know, like everyone's making him do this. And he like they should if they cared for him. They would tell him to like not stuff. There was all these things going around and yeah. gossip, you know, I don't know a lot about that, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't know those conversations. Mm -hmm. I only know that conversation that I had with him, which yeah. was dude way too early, you know, yeah, take yeah. time off. Like you got money, you got everything you need. Get get better. Get over this, mm -hmm. you know. Like now, a days, you know, uh, mental health's at the forefront. Then I don't, it wasn't. Right. Um, but there was an aspect of like, dude, take some time. But he was, dude, he was such a tough dude. Yeah. Like mentally headstrong person. When Strongest he to... person I knew, honestly. Like he just, he had gone through so much at a young age, you know, that it's like he can handle this. I think is what a lot of people maybe thought. Right, right, right. And, um, but I, I don't know a lot about the management part of it. I, you know, Kevin Kersley probably knows more than I do because he did a lot of those interviews and talked to a lot more people about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I honestly didn't want to go down that rabbit hole too much. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 you know, I prefer not to know, right. you know, some of those things. Um, I definitely think that he was, if you, if you just look at the timeline that it took Travis to get back to performing, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. He versus the timeline that it took Adam to get back to performing, yeah, yeah. there is a massive difference. Now, granted, Travis lost two of his best friends right. in that and did suffer a considerable burns worse than Adam did. Mm -hmm. But he took a lot more time. Yeah. And that, I think that was a good thing for Travis's well-being. I think Adam would have been better served to take more time. Mm -hmm. um, I know that he had to take prescription medications to get right. on those on the plane and to do yeah. all these things that he was doing. Also, though, it shouldn't be lost that that last year of his life, he did the biggest things that he had ever done. Right. Two. And they were triumphant successes. 
So it's a very mixed bag of kind of like what's too much, what's, you know, I mean, I don't have all the answers for it. Did you personally see a change? I mean, you know, what would, like what were the changes maybe you saw like right after the crash when you were with him? Did you notice anything different with him or it just seemed like he was kind of the same? He was the same in, in the sense of, I mean, he was more sensitive, hmm. I think. Um, like how so? Like just like more sentimental about yes. things, right? Yeah. He started posting a lot of like, photos from like his youth on his Facebook page. Right. Um, he, yeah, he, he softened up, I think a little bit. He started doing stuff more with just like closer friends and older friends and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but in terms of his, you know, overall, he was still the same dude. Right. Um, I didn't see like, he didn't, he didn't change dramatically. He definitely didn't change at all that I saw in the last months of his life. He was the same dude. Wow. Um, so I would ask him questions because he was doing that show for MTV, which we all kind of thought was like right. not the best idea. Too right. close. And uh, I remember asking him about that. And I, I got, like I said, hey man, how's that show going for MTV? And he's like, oh man, it's really hard. Yeah. And I didn't know what that meant. So that was I was like- It was really hard to see that in the documentary. Yeah, it's it was, tough. It's, in the documentary, it seemed like such a fucking mistake. Right. Especially when you see his reaction. Well, in retrospect, it was a giant mistake. Yeah, but you was. gotta remember, nobody else saw that footage except the MTV execs. Right. Right? Like nobody saw that until after the fact, right? But I remember asking him, he said, it's hard. And I, and I thought he meant like, it's just hard to make a documentary where you're the host. Right. And like, I'm thinking like from a just making it point of view, it's hard. Time Not answer. realizing that he's probably telling me it's hard for me to be in this environment. Mm. But I didn't make that connection uh, at the time. Right. Because we didn't talk about that. Like that wasn't our relationship. Our relationship wasn't that world. Our relationship was music, right? Yeah. So now he would have said that to one of his other friends that maybe he had that connection with. They might have taken it to, totally differently. Mm -hmm. But I took it like he was just sort of struggling to make this thing interesting to any for anybody to watch. Right. But that's, I don't think that's what he meant. In retrospect, I, I believe he was telling me, this is, I, I don't know if I should be doing this. Right. But I didn't pick up on that at the time. Because that's a, you know, he wasn't giving me a lot to go on. He's just saying it's hard. Well, yeah, yeah. hard how, you know? And he didn't really want to talk about it. So I just left it alone. With AM, you know, it was like, you could try to talk to him about something. He didn't want to talk about it. He wasn't going to talk about it. So you just, all right, next topic. Right, you know? right. But when you saw the footage of him like at the police station with all the bags of yeah. of drugs, you, you understood exactly what he was. That was a devastating moment for me. When we were making the documentary, I had a really hard time with that. Well, it sounds like you were thinking about it because you're bringing up that statement of him saying it was hard, like, you know. Well, that's so, when it occurred to me that I had had that conversation right. with him because that's just one moment. And I mean, I talked to him all the time, you know. But like when I saw that, when Kevin showed me that footage, I was like, oh. That's what he meant. And then yep. buying the crack pipe and the grape soda for like a the, dollar, some shit like that. The thing that killed me the most in the, in the documentary is all the drugs are on the table and he's standing there and it's very awkward. Mm -hmm. But Kevin left the footage where he's walking down the street and afterwards and he shakes his hands out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when I saw that, man, I was just like, I just teared up because I was like, there it is. That's the moment. Like that's, that was a, that was an incredibly difficult thing for him at that moment. Mm -hmm. right. And, uh, you know, I'd never seen it before. I mean, this was five years after he died. And I was like, oh my God, you know, and it, it makes you feel helpless kind of, you know, like I wish I would have said something. But then you think like, you know, he went to New York to do this on his own. He knew what to do. He knew what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Nobody was going to stop him. Yeah. You know, I mean, he had the money, he had the way to do it. And that's just how it went down, you know? And it's a fucking tragedy, you know? And it, it's be above and beyond losing like a good human being. You know, it's like the DJ world lost an incredibly important piece. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it permanently altered the direction that we were going. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, I went through all the various stages of like grief, you know, like being upset. I lost a friend, you know, and then being pissed off, mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff, you know, I think that's natural, you know, but I'm kind of at a point now where like, it's like, okay, I got, I got his story out. I got the legacy out. Like it can live now out there. And people who are interested, if they are interested, can go seek it out and learn about it. Right. And that's good enough. Like I let my friend rest, you know? It, it, it's hard because it's, it's kind of like 
you're the person cleaning up after the party Mm -hmm. and but it's like you know you've been doing you've been cleaning up for the past yeah like over 10 years 14 years right yeah 14 yeah yeah i've been cleaning up for a long time man and it's (laughs) and you kind of want to just let it go and i do or somebody else could i mean hey anybody else that wants to do it yeah you know can do it that's i have no problem with that i I feel you like you you wanted to get this three hour this three hour um doc that you know that focused it on his dj right and you wanted people to remember that part of it because it was so it's what we want to remember yeah. you know it's like because right. we remember that first right you know what i'm saying and uh it's what i want to see too and it, like if i was going to show like my kid or, or another younger dj I would, i'd probably tell them watch you know the kevin scott documentary first and then watch probably the real documentary the original right. documentary you know, just so you can see you know i, I totally i appreciate that because that's the goal right yeah. that was the goal i think the only thing that was a bummer for me was like we we didn't have budget on these bonus extras so i couldn't yeah. really put it i couldn't make it as polished it's just people talking right yeah, yeah. but it's pretty I, raw it's, it's pretty raw, raw. Yeah. No, and that's by design i mean yeah. you know, we only have so much to go around one editor like i mean yeah. it's it's raw you know what i mean yeah. it's like the original footage but also it allows you to focus on the subject matter more mm-hmm. uh, if you want to see something real polished and like interesting then go watch the movie right mm-hmm. but the bonus feature is just the story yeah and it's just the story of him as a dj and for the people there's a lot of people that struggle with addiction and and for them adam is the north star for that too right 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 and so then you have that part of it too if you want to go learn about that then go learn about that and i've been watching that as kevin gets them done and, and send them over and they're incredible they're super heavy mm-hmm. but they're amazing the, the the stuff that he had to deal with on a human level yeah growing up through his teen years and even after mm-hmm are nuts and there's stuff that didn't even make the film that's in the bonus features you know that like is man you got to watch it it's crazy like the stuff that he went through it's amazing that he made it even made it past his 18th birthday wow so this is this is all going to be on amazon eventually yeah yeah it'll be on amazon it'll be on uh itunes you know just the the regular outlets where you can you know get a film but for right now it's on the djamdoc.com and i i think it's important you know to mention you know throughout all of this Kevin Scott has not profited or attempted to profit from any of his contributions that he's made, to, you know, to DJ AM. I, and I want to make sure we clarify this, that, you know, Kevin Scott has been preserving, protecting and showcasing DJ AM's legacy since his passing out of friendship. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, you know, this is from the social media account, DJ AM Lives, to the documentary, you know, to, to even now with the unreleased footage and the extended version of the documentary. This film actually lost money. We got to make sure that the people know that this, you know, this film actually lost money when it released. And any profits that's made now from this extended version to the unreleased footage, all of this new stuff they're going to profit on is actually going to go to the investors, you know, who could you know, hopefully finally make their money back as DJs and, you know, as just fans of DJ AM, we, we, we support this. And then so like, what, what, what's, what's going on with you moving forward? I feel like, you know, a chapter's maybe closing a little bit for you. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, you've been the caretaker right, for AM's legacy for a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah. For a long time. For a long, for a long time. time. For the whole yeah. time, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had my DJ career, you know, from 88 to 2013, 25 years, yeah. and then been the DJ AM caretaker, you know, yeah. worked on some other little projects here and there. I'm working on a new business with my man, Drew Pierce. It's called Maestro. It's shout out to Drew Pierce. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Drew Pierce. Um, it's a, it's an app that's going to connect DJs with their clients, mainly for mobile DJs. Mm-hmm. So um, it's called you know, Maestro. It's going to be called Maestro. Mm. And what it does is for on the DJ side, those, those will be like our customers, right? Yeah. It'll keep track of all of their events and it will connect them directly with their uh, client. So the client will like log in and be able to answer questions about the event. Like let's say they're getting married, it'll have all their information. Like, mm-hmm. you know, where's the reception, all this type of stuff. We'll keep track of it. And then they'll be able to choose all their music, like link to Spotify or Apple Music or whatever, and choose the songs they want for certain things like yeah, in yeah. their wedding or if it's like a corporate party or whatever. And on the DJ side, it's almost like an assistant. It'll keep track of like all their events and it will show them all the stuff that the that the client wants like mm-hmm. musically and all the stuff about the event and then it also will have a chat component to it as well so you'll be able to talk directly you don't have to deal with like oh, wow. text messages and emails and all that kind of stuff so um, how long you've been working on this a few years yeah man. sounds like it that's the reason i didn't come on the <laughs> podcast before is because we've been working on this i wanted to talk about it then so wait is this launching when is this launching we don't have an official date yet okay. but um we've been working hard on it we do have something that's getting much closer so we are aiming for early 2024 
Wow. Mm. Um, so that's kind of next on the agenda for me is, is creating something for the DJ world. Not necessarily the DJ world that I was in, but Drew had this idea. He does a lot of mobile events, a lot of weddings. Mm-hmm. And he kind of pitched it to me like, hey, what do you think about this idea? Would you want to you know, partner up and do something with this? And I love the idea. I was like, this, is a, this isn't something that's really out there. And it seems like something that's really usable because one of the big hassles that you know mobiles have is like getting that information from their clients and typically it's like you know they have to fill out a piece of paper or like go on a website a lame outdated website it's right. like what if they could just do it on their phone when they're whatever getting their hair done or something this seems yeah. so much easier so let's make a really simple intuitive app that makes it really easy for them to do that so that's what we've been aiming to do and it's a big it was a big project i know it sounds Fairly simple, but it's a big project. It's taken a lot of time for yeah. to design it and to code it and all that stuff. But we're getting much closer, so that's that's what's next. Wow, sounds exciting. Yeah, let us know, man. We'll you know we'll pitch you have it to out have me when back it's on. ready. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, try to get some customers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do it. I'm, I'm thinking because I do a lot of private events. I'm like, oh, that sounds really fucking easy because yeah. it's, yeah. it's just hard to get everything in one place. Especially trying to communicate with, like, you know, the different people that you have to connect with when you're doing private events. Yeah, that's the goal. So yeah, that's, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I actually wanted to ask you something, uh, you know, uh, about when Dexstar, you know, when AM passed. And, you know, in my head, I thought Dexstar would continue. Yeah. You know, and uh, but it seemed like it just slowly started to disband. Mm-hmm. And everyone kind of went their separate ways. Yeah. I think some people c- tried to stay on. But I was, I was kind of going to ask you, like... I'm sure Anne was an integral part of, of that agency at the time, you know. Right. But it kind of like, I, you know, from your perspective, what was happening when Anne passed and how, you know, because it's like a domino effect. It affects so many people, you know, someone that was so impactful as he was, you know, e- everyone was kind of like working with him and tied to him. And then when he passes, it's like, you know, what goes, what happens after? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. We were left with more questions than answers, honestly. Really? Um, Shelby DeForge was somebody who grew up with Adam. Yeah. He decided to come on and take on the OGs. Like, so he was trying to manage us at the time. It was a few of us. I think at that time, I think Jazzy Jeff joined, right? Yeah, he was a part of it. Yeah. It was part because he was touring with uh, Jazzy Jeff and AM. I remember they were doing like stuff in Miami at Mansion together. Mm-hmm. And it was crazy. It was like... Yeah, yeah. the 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 four turntables and you know yep. two DJs two mixes shit yeah yep um, there was everything screeched to a halt right after he passed away yeah right so it took a little time to kind of like I didn't do a gig I think I canceled everything for like a month or two but I just was like I can't go DJ mm-hmm. um, right now so it took a time and then you know we all tried to rally together and try to like figure out a path forward but so everyone kind of wanted to keep it going. Or no, in really. terms of DJing, yes, and in terms of like trying to do something within Dexstar, yes, but there, it just there wasn't enough um, communication. I feel like from, mm-hmm. maybe from the top, and I no one like, was taking the initiative to like bring everyone together. Was I think that every kind of that's true. Yeah. I think everybody was hurting. Yeah, um, I think Shelby tried, but I don't. You know, he had just really started at Dexstar, and so like, it, you know, and then. I don't really know what was going on behind the scenes, like in terms of the management side of it, like selling the gigs and the people and all that. Like, I don't know. I mean, I continued to work with them for maybe a year or so after. Yeah. Uh, And then eventually just went independent. But I, by then I was almost at the end of what I wanted to do anyway. I was starting a family and close to 40 and just kind of like had, you know, tinnitus. I was like, I'm done, you know? (laughs) Really? Yeah. So I was like, I was, I was pretty, pretty cooked at that point, you know? So I just, uh, I was ready to move on, but, um, I don't know, you know, like I remember fashion was one of the first to, to, to move on. Yeah. You know, the, it's like when the band is starting to break apart Mm -hmm. and it's like, Oh, this is the end, right? Oh man, this is the end, you know? And then it just, then it was the end and everybody went their own way. And it was like, okay. I remember like, you know, fashion left and scene left, and that was it. And 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 they went in a different direction. In fairness to Dexstar, Dexstar realized that they wanted to do artists, mm. so they started doing more artist stuff and trying to do festivals and things like that. Mm-hmm. So they were taking on different client base than DJs. I think there was more money there for them too. Right. 
And so they started to kind of go that direction and we all kind of went another direction. Yeah. And things were changing too, musically, things were changing. Like there was just a, kind of a lot of stuff. There was a lot of stuff happening. It was, but um, I remember trying to hang on for a little while, but it just wasn't the same. Without AIM, it wasn't the same, you know? So, yeah. um, and we all got, the other thing I should note about that too is we all got into it because of AIM. AIM chose us. Mm-hmm. Those guys that were running the management, they didn't choose us. Yeah. Well, AM was rallying for you guys. Right. Right. These are my guys. But if you have someone running a company and, you know, you know, running a company is not easy. It's about the bottom line. So for them, if if they if they have a, uh, another direction that's more lucrative for them, that's they're right. going to go there. Yep. Especially when the person rallying for the DJs isn't there anymore. That's right. Yeah. So I think that, you know, that's what happened basically with that. Wow. Yeah. There was no big like blowout or anything yeah, like no. that. I mean, just kind of fell apart. It's kind of like what you said. It's like you know, when like, oh shit, this this might be over, and then yep. slowly it starts becoming over, right? Yeah, <clears throat> it just uh, it just got kind of sadder. You know what I mean? Right. Because like you know, you show up to the office and it's like, this is the house that AM built, and you're not here. Yeah. You see like the the Daft Punk costume statue in the corner mm -hmm. which was his you know yeah that kind of stuff and it's just like man we we lost the whole reason this is here right yeah. you know there was a there was a part of me that was like really really rooting for you guys you know after am passing i said you know i hope those guys can keep dexter alive keep it yeah. going because that'll be dope you know like 10 years from now dexter's still around yeah they've still got a roster of djs and like it's like the house that AM built, like you said. Right. And like, you know, there's a roster of DJs that are like continuing the legacy. That know? would have been that would have been cool. Would have been beautiful. Yeah, I mean, realistically, I probably should have just stopped DJing and then got into like, you know, doing some of the management side of that. Right. I was about to ask you that. Do you ever think yeah. of bringing it back or some sort of that to keep that side of his legacy alive? I haven't really thought about that. This is the first. I mean, this is tough, man. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it no, seems like I'm, a hard business. I'm just saying like the blueprint that he laid out yeah. With you guys. Yeah, like, I I was going to ask you about you guys about that, because yeah. I haven't DJed in a long time. I mean, the contacts so, are different. The Well, not not are, that part oh, of it. Yeah. I was going to ask you guys more about, when I stopped DJing, mm -hmm. I was in the club, and it was still early socials. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, You're people, saying, like, there people, was, weren't, people weren't posting on social media all the time. Right, they right, right. They didn't live their life through their phone as much. Yeah. Nearly yeah. as much. You wouldn't see that many phones out. Mm -hmm. But now, it feels to me like the biggest obstacles to DJ are the phones, because you're competing literally against a crowd that would rather be on their phone than paying attention to what you're doing. To me, that seems like I can't even imagine trying to fight that. Like that seems a really tough uphill battle. I'm sure there's some clubs where like it's sort of frowned upon, but mm -hmm. I don't know, man. It just seems like everybody pulls out their phone in the middle and like middle of a club and middle of a song that they like and they just start filming themselves and it just feels so foreign to me because yeah, yeah. when i quit that wasn't that didn't exist yeah yeah no That's i think crazy it's, <laughs> I, I think it's a it's a little more accepted like we're, we're it's a part of the experience now but what, what it's really about is that people want to go to events or venues where they can document a happening or yeah. a moment sure so now it's up to the dj to create those moments that people want to document but but you meaning know. that it's changed the way you DJ, right? Because you that create, is yeah. that is a part of yeah, to create a moment. And what I'm saying is, yeah. is like that didn't exist. So I never thought that way. Mm -hmm. I just thought like I'm going to take them on this musical journey. Like we're going to hit everything, but I want to do it in my way. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, if like everybody's got their phone, out, you can't be boring for any length of time. Otherwise, it's like <laughs> you just lose everybody, right? Yeah. And it seems like it, the DJing that the phone has allowed has made DJing evolve. Like you have to think about your sets kind of differently now. Is that true or or no? Yeah, I, th I think it, you know. I think it's changed, but I, you know, I'm I maybe in it too much where I can't really like specify the breakdown of like where it changed because oh, right, we've right. been dealing with this for the past yeah yeah a long time I don't ten know Harvard yeah ten yeah, yeah. plus years right right so like we're used to it sure. and like you know we we've had this conversation where you've talked about like years ago when it was like becoming maybe more of a problem, but now it's like just part it, of it it just seems like it's part of it but yeah. also like the crowd kind of understands like you know it's it's it is what it is like, you're either going to be on your phone or you're going to be part of this this it's vibe. just an accepted thing it's just yeah. part of it and a lot of honestly the, a lot of the dope parties that are going on right now and the venues that are dope you know like phones aren't really out mm. like you know the 
the kids understand it. Like they understand, like you know, there's there's a time and a place for some shit, you know. Right. And it, you know, it's not always about the phone. Like, uh. so there's like kind of an understanding of what's going on. I could be wrong, but you know, like, no, I no, you, I don't you're, see prob- you're probably 100 percent right. Yeah, I think no, you're more I, important. I think uh, what I'm thinking is, is like, you know, I have I have a 12 year old. Yeah. Right. You know, junior high, right? <laughs> Middle school, tough, right? Right. It's tough. It's a tough <laughs> age. You know what I mean? And the and you know you see some of the kids like the phone is like inseparable. Yeah. Like you and and it's like started making me think about like damn man like everybody's like you go out to dinner like everybody's staring at their phones like right. whole family isn't talking to each other staring at their phones and then I started thinking about it in terms of like DJ I'm like man that must be hard like. If it, I mean, like I said, I don't go out to clubs that much, right? Mm-hmm. But I was just thinking about that. I wanted to ask you guys about that because I'm thinking, man, that's that that seems like something you have to battle against yeah. in a way where it's like their attention. Like, are they paying attention to what's going on? Are they paying attention to their phone? But I, I think there's also like, you know, like these kids know. they like If they're going out and their friends are always on their phone, they're like, I don't want to go out that person. Yeah. Uh, you know I, what I'm saying? Like, I think the phone is more so to create the moment of, look what I'm doing. I'm outside. We're having the greatest times. Yeah. You should be here. You're missing out. Right. I think that's the moment. It's, it's about capturing the moment. Yeah, it's right more now. so gotcha. than that. Yeah, yeah. So if okay. you if you if you want to put in a tense of DJing, you do have to be a little bit more interesting yeah. to create those moments. Yeah. But you're not battling somebody, you know, they got dressed up and they got ready to go outside and they're just scrolling on Instagram while they're at the club. I don't think that's happening as oh, much. Okay. It's, it's really also like, you know, like people are putting that like now it's like if you look at a DJ and a DJ is DJing and they see a flashlight on them. They're gonna change their disposition, right? Yeah, they're not gonna have Serato face anymore. <laughs> like they're gonna be like they're gonna be like, oh, they're like, gonna yeah, look at the phone, right? You know, they're gonna like kind of act it out. But like the the way DJs are trained now, they're trained to be in front of a camera. Yeah. yeah. So if they see someone filming, they're gonna change their energy and yeah. be like, oh, now I'm the charisma. Now, you know, <laughs> cameras on, lights, camera, action, like here. Like this is me now. It reminds me of that Ross one video from like ten years ago. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Keep it boring. <laughs> you're boring as shit. Oh, keep it moving. <laughs> I love that. So yeah. good. The keep it moving. Yeah, 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 yeah so yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I feel like it's it's on. You know, like people know how to turn on. The DJs know how to turn on now. Yeah, they know how to be a more performative and. It's an added skill to the repertoire. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I'd be like a deer in yeah. headlights. I'd be like, what? No, yeah. It's not. Yo, you, you know, like, you know, we're concentrating on the next song. We're like, right. We're looking at the crowd. They they're already like they're doing the same thing and they're doing more and they're just becoming better entertainers. entertainers. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's good. Is that weird for you though? Like, because you, you came up, you know, like like I did in a vinyl era. We're in a dark corner with no lights on us, right? Yeah, yeah. And now yeah. now you're like a whole different yeah. performer, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not that performative. You know? Oh, you're not? <laughs> no, oh. but like he, I, you know, if you if he sees a flashlight, he'll turn on. Oh yeah, I, I got to put the smile on and everything. Yeah. Oh nice, yeah, yeah. but. It, it, it was something because I did grow up watching you guys and it was a little bit different to be like, oh, you kind of have to turn it on as soon as the camera comes on. Yeah. Because back then, the only thing I could compare it to is when, uh, 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 and I don't know if anybody's going to know this, but remember those flip cameras? Of course. Yeah. So you'll bring out a flip camera and it's kind of like, oh, you're on, you're on camera. Right. But once the flip camera leaves your, you, you know, your vicinity, yeah. that's it. But I, I think that's the closest I can compare it to. Yeah, it makes sense. I just yeah. have to change my disposition because back in the day, if I saw a camera on me, my face would be like, "The what fuck the are you fuck filming you me?" Yeah. For? <laughs> yeah. like I, I'd have this like, "Yo, are you fucking filming me right now?" Yeah. Energy, and I had to change that to be like, "Oh, was good, was good." Yeah, yeah. That, so that's, like, that's the know. crooked eye. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because you, now you're getting posted without your con- yeah, so like of what's going so on. Someone's all happy. They're like, "Oh shit, crooked with him." I'm like, "Yo, what the fuck you filming me yeah, for?" Yeah, face, yeah, you know, yeah. like it, it, it fucks up the whole energy. Totally. So now, yeah, yeah. So now yeah, I just yeah. gotta be like, "Yo, what's good? What's good?" You know. Must have taken some practice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some practice in front of the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can do it too. Oh you know? uh, yeah. man, I'm good. We gotta bring yeah. you out of retirement. <laughs> I have a question for you, and uh, this is just out of a fan perspective. Who has his laptops? Who has DJ Am's laptops? Like his library of iTunes, that I mean, he had. and his and I mean, his sneaker collection. Everything, no, well, they right? they sold partially some they of that them for them? the documentary. But who has the laptops? Because as a fan, I was always man, like, what is in there? You want to scroll through and just see it, like some type of like a museum exhibit that you just want to sit there and just scroll through the That's iTunes. Great question. Okay, let's break it down one by one. There. <laughs> okay, all right. So the shoes were sold shortly after he passed away. His sister. Mm-hmm. Put that together, and that was an eBay auction to start his foundation, the DJ AM Foundation. Mm-hmm. So all the shoes were sold at that time, except for a few pairs. Mm-hmm. Um, How much did they raise? One hundred and fifty-three thousand. You got, oh. yeah. They sold a lot of his shoes, though. I think, yeah, it was, it was 
Yeah. It's like he didn't have seven hundred pairs or something. Yeah, he like didn't have a little bit. He had a lot. Yeah, he had a lot. That was a lot of work. Um, actually, on those uh, certificate of authenticity, that's yeah. my wife wrote all those out. Oh, and, really? Yeah, I have yeah. one of those, and that's how I, people will send it to me. Is this one legit? You know, and I'll be like, Yeah, that's my wife's writing. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, but but we all kind of worked on that and helped the family out with that. Yeah. Then his records were sold a while after that, and his sister was again involved in that mm -hmm. at the Palladium, right? Uh, it was at the Cobra uh, Cobra Shop, Cobra Snakes Shop, uh -huh. and oh, we wow. sold all the records there. And then um, not long after that, his sister passed away. She had cancer, and oh. she passed away. Um, and then uh, so the laptops, there were a lot of laptops. <laughs> he, had, he had quite a few. He didn't okay. have one, okay? So he had quite a few. The family had has at least two that I know of now, his last two. Hmm. Um, I have copies of everything that was on those drives. Wow. And then there were other laptops, earlier ones that I, I know Marshall Barnes has one mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I'm not sure who else. I think the family also has his desktop, which had a lot of stuff on it. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I know of where they are. But I know two laptops for sure still reside with his mother. Along with the, like his mom has like the, the dog tags. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The Daft Punk right. leathers and like the laptops and stuff like that. So it's still within the family. And his mom's still doing well. Um, but uh, that's where those are, yeah. I don't know where all the laptops are. I mean, you got to think, like he started with a power book. Remember those? Mm. And then, you know, kind of worked his way up. So there was a lot of laptops, but yeah. No, more so I was like the computer, the last computer that he was, the one with the Iron Man face on it. Yeah. With the logo, like mm -hmm. that was... The, that specific library yeah his mom has that laptop oh, okay. and i have that library okay, okay you you're curious to see like how his crates are organized. yeah i want to see so, that like what's in there i uh, yeah so i fired it up yeah. plugged it in and took a bunch of screenshots of all of the organization oh, really? wow so i did have i do have screenshots of a lot of his organization but uh i don't know if that laptop still works or not so what i did is i just i pulled all the data off of it yeah yeah but i can't replicate like that in another environment so mm -hmm. i can't replicate the serato in another environment so if that computer still works then it's all still there but i do have screenshots of it and wow. i do have his personal collection of mp3s because that needed to be preserved you know mm -hmm. in my mind are you ever going to put that out well i mean i, I, <laughs> I'm I, sorry. Can't, I, I can't really yeah, yeah. put it out but i mean i just felt like for the purposes of archiving mm -hmm. that needed to be saved yeah yeah you know what i mean how how did he organize his crates? Do you do you remember how it looked? Uh, so he would have funny names for for <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> for like events and stuff like that. Uh -huh. But he had like you know, um, so he had a few different things: banana split crates, and then he had like his regular crates, and then like you know he had like you know he really liked like uh, rare groove and like funky stuff from like seventies and eighties, you know, like the Elton John type stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, he he called that crate smooth honky. <laughs> yeah so he had like these funny names for stuff you know did he have yeah. his crates under venues like banana split uh i don't know lax so on and so no forth. well he did have banana split stuff right uh -huh. um because that was like every week uh for years right mm -hmm. but uh no like they were they were split into like categories so like he he had like a smooth and sexy which was like all r&b Mm. you know and then he had like you know smooth honky which was like you know all that all that <laughs> stuff right and then you know he he was funny with it you know but then right. he had like a club bangers crate you know and um he had some stuff that was just his routines so it would be like a lot of the tracks kind of in order right like his routine stuff and you know he they were pretty big crates so he would jump around like it wouldn't he wouldn't just play them in order but like he could jump around and mix and match stuff but he definitely had like stuff he's known for like you guys know him for certain stuff like of course you know another one bites the dust into journey and like you yep. know the wonder wall mix and things like that so he had all that kind of laid out like in a crate that mm -hmm. was just like signature am stuff right? mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know, man. We can look at the screenshots afterwards. Yeah, kind of yeah, cool. man. A peek. Can we uh, can we post some of them on the YouTube or no? On this episode right uh, now? Mm -hmm. you, oh, we'll post them like in the background. Yeah, you don't have to yeah. look at my face. You can see like a screenshot. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just to show uh, like kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. Probably. Okay, cool. Oh, we'll amazing. And before you leave, I just want to say as a fan of AM, thank you for all the contributions you've done. Yeah. It sounds like it's been a difficult ride for you, but we appreciate it. 
uh, everything you've done from the mixes being put out on Mixcloud to the documentary. I know that was difficult for you. Uh, even to one of my favorite parts of the documentary and probably my favorite mix of his is the Power 106 uh, 2005 mm -hmm. uh, Mixmas one that he, he was on. And if it wasn't for you, that would have never happened. And that's probably my first introduction to AM. So I want to thank you for that and just everything you've done for his legacy to keep yeah. it alive. Because if it wasn't for you, Lord knows where his legacy would be at this point. And having screenshots, having articles, I mean, three-hour edits of a new part of his his documentary. Like, truly, truly, truly appreciate what you've done. Yeah. Uh, thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. For sure. Thank you. Yeah, Kevin Scott, you know. I'm, it's been a pleasure, man. I'm, I'm glad you. we finally had you on here. Yeah, man. Thank yeah. you for having me. And then, yo, let us know when the app is ready. Yeah, I'd love to come Maestro. back on. Tell some more stories. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, sounds good, brother. Thank All you. All right, man. Kevin Scott, thank, thank you, you, man. If you want to watch more episodes from Rogue Podcast, click either links on the left or the right. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page and get updated on new uploads throughout the week. Peace. <laughs>